What's up, everybody? Uh, look, today's guest for Hold My Beer po- NC Podcast is a beautiful man. He's got a great story to tell. Uh, story so good and vulnerability so deep that we ended up having to split it up into two separate parts. But I want to welcome you into this podcast today for the first part. My special guest, Kyle Perry. So what's up, everybody? So welcome in, welcome in to the first episode of this legendary podcast. Um, that intro song was uh, brought to you by one of my good buddies that I was my uh, partner on a soccer team when I was in high school. His name's Travis Shallow, and um, he's also a sober individual, and he gave us those rights to that beautiful song, Paper Trail. So uh, we're going to use it for the time being until he makes us one for uh, the podcast. But um, I don't know if you noticed, but I got on my camo today um, in in mem- remembrance and in memory of the plane crash a couple weeks ago uh, that happened with the Rawls family and the Parks family. So um, I just wanted to point that out and let those both of those families know if they hear this that here in the studio that we are dedicating this episode or this portion of our episode to them and um, that we wanted to wear cam- I wanted to wear camo in remembrance of the Rawls family and the Parks family and we wanted to continue to pray for uh, Down East. Mm-hmm. Um, also, the entire episode I'm dedicating to my mother, Terry Williams. So a lot of dedications this morning and uh, at this time, respectfully, we're going to take a small moment of silence for them. So... Amen. That's God's work, baby. So without further ado, um, as I told you in the introduction, uh, Kyle Perry's with us today, uh, seven years sober, and uh, he's got a great story to tell. So we're just going to get into this thing and, and get it rocking and kick back and have a good time. What's Here, up, baby? What's going on, big dog? Man, it must be you. Here we are, huh? Oh, yeah, we are we Man, are you guys here. have uh, really outdone yourself in here. I mean, this is an impressive little setup you yeah, got going. Yeah, killed, didn't it? Forever, he's, Tyler's always been a person that's like, when he does something, like, he just goes a thousand miles an hour, just full board. And, uh, you know, between you and Ben and the team over here, you guys have done this. Like, it's pretty impressive stuff, so. Thanks, man. I, I appreciate it. We, uh... Yeah, going hard. I had to. I had to stop going hard in the other direction and That's start going hard into sobriety. But man, I got you here today, and you know, it's, your story is really powerful, man. You're like a little brother to me, and um, I want to share your story out with the world, and and I think that it's gonna impact a lot of people, man. And um, you and I talked over the past couple of weekends. You'd come out of the house, have a cigar. And, yeah, yeah. You know, we'd we'd go back and forth on things, and I was like, man, don't tell me the story in your words yet, because. I wanted to wait for it to come here and I wanted you to tell your side of everything the way that you want to tell it sure here in this space what I like to call sacred space and and just uh just let the world hear how impactful your mission was after you realized you had a problem and you got clean and all of that and um, we just kind of go into it however you want to. But why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself, where you're from. If you yeah, want to yeah. start from the very beginning, um, that we're, this is a no-hurry zone. No doubt. So No doubt. So <clears throat> before we jump really kind of into, into the nuts and bolts about, like, you know, what went on with me and what's still going on with me, I want to mention, too, for people that are watching, is, is 
um, my experience is just my experience, right? And, and um, I, I work in behavioral health. Uh, I'm employed in behavioral health. I help a lot of people. And, and that doesn't mean that, you know, again, my experience is just my experience. There's no monopoly on, on, on this thing, like how people get sober. I know, I know, like we mentioned before, it's like I know 10 different ways that people have got sober and they live, live incredible lives, right? So um, wherever this kind of goes, just, just remember that, 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 you know, this is just my experience and, and it doesn't reflect any one way on, on how to get sober and how to get clean and kind of change up your life. It's just my story and just my experience, right? Because I think at the end right. of the day, that's all we've got. It's just our experience, right? Right. There's 10 ways to build a house, you know? Yeah. And, 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 and for sure. You know, there's one well, that way was, that Tyler Williams does it. Well, that was the, that was one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on yeah. was because I didn't go to treatment. Right. So like I got sober at the altar, right? Like praise God, baby, right. like doing the Lord's work. Right. Like I got sober on Sunday mornings on my knees, right. You know, with worship songs in the background, tear eyes full of tears, yeah, yeah. pastor hand on my shoulder, right down to my knees being sore because I was on that altar so much in prayer. And so that's one way. Now that's, I highly recommend that that be a staple in everybody's life. And that's why I'm that's pushing this message out. But you're right. There, there are multiple ways to do it. So yeah, carry on brother. Yeah, man. Um, I'm a, uh, like Tyler mentioned, uh, I got a sobriety date January 23rd to 2015. Two days away from mine. Two days away. Right. How cool is that? Two days from mine. Yeah. And I remember when, when you started kind of hinting at that over the phone like hey man i'm thinking about you know and you'd ask some questions here or there and then and then we'd later date shelf it and come back to it and yeah um and when you said you well you, you inspired me on the 23rd like then the 24th and like all the stars kind of lined up and then you inspired that so i was like okay you know so you were one of the inspirations well i'm glad to hear um but yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing to kind of sit in this space with you like like this, right? Because it yeah. wasn't always like this. No doubt, it was not always <laughs> like this, right? And <laughs> um, but like I said, I got a sobriety date January twenty third, two thousand fifteen. Um, I walked into uh, treatment in California January twenty second, two thousand fifteen. I would definitely not call that day my sobriety date. Um, that was a disaster. Um, but uh, I'm a local kid right here from Greenville. Um, I came up and was raised just like a lot of people that we know, right? Um, <clears throat> I, uh, you know, I, I say this a lot when, when I talk because I think a lot of people have a, uh, a, a idea about somebody who's an addict or an alcoholic, like the environment that they potentially come from, like broken homes or split up families or things like that. It's not my story whatsoever. Like, it's quite the opposite, you know, um, I grew up in a house where, like, I say a lot that it it would be impossible to put more love and support in that house. Right. It'd be impossible. Sure. You know, um, I mean, I can't. Likewise. Uh, yeah. Sure. I mean, I just, it, that's just how it was. And, um, you know, I can remember being a little kid and, and truly not being okay with myself, right? To the right. point where, uh, like, extreme insecurities, you know, and, uh, I would really try to hold that in and, and not share that with a lot of people. But I can remember being five, six, seven, eight, and really struggling internally, right? Um, a serious battle going on. And now that I'm older and had time to reflect and, and, and um, had a lot of people pull me through those situations and, and, and kind of talk it out and really kind of give me insight on potentially about what was really going on there, um, I now realize that that was very abnormal for for feelings of a six seven eight year old right right um for example like again i mentioned I, I was well taken care of as a kid very spoiled well taken care of and and um i always like for instance if i could have the newest pair of cle nike cleats that there are right and yeah. but that kid's cleats are way cooler than mine. right even right. though they're a model older it doesn't matter like yeah. i might be faster than that kid but i run weird yeah right or um I just always felt that I just was not enough. Yeah. Always. And and that was um, a staple that carried with me for a long time. And I don't think that a lot of people knew that. I think I hid that about myself a lot. And I think I hid it very well. Um, but it was definitely there. Um, sure. I mean, I would take um, situations of, of letdown to the extreme. For instance, like I remember I, when I was in elementary school, I, I kept trying to show up uh, to uh, a boy scout. I wanted to be a boy scout. Right. So right. we'd show up to the thing on Friday night 
at the cafeteria at Walcoats and uh, everybody signs up and and uh, I went two times and for some reason they never called me. <laughs> they never called me. Just got the ghost. <laughs> Just got the ghost. And I can remember like my my dad looking at me like I have no idea. Yeah. You know uh, what's going on and I would be so upset Ooh. that they just didn't they didn't want me. Yeah. I wasn't good enough. Like that for some reason Kyle just didn't cut it and they didn't Kyle couldn't be a boy scout. He wasn't cool enough. And uh little stuff like that and I would take that and I would and I would bury it and just carry it, you know? Yeah. Um <clears throat> had another situation when I was in little league, you know, um I played little league ball right here in Greenville, Elm Street Park and 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 yeah. all that stuff and uh I, uh, my, ni- my nine-year-old year, they had me come up to the majors, which is where the 12-year-olds play, 11 and 12-year-olds play. I got to uh, come up, and, and somebody liked me, apparently, and uh, I had a pretty good year, and I should have, all I should have said, I should have been an All-Stars, right? Like, you should have made All-Stars. You did a great year, and these yeah. are your stats, I guess, and, and what have you, and, and it came time for me to step into, like, All-Star team, and I got overpicked. Right. Somebody else went. A coach's son went instead of me. And, and I remember taking that and like sitting at my parents kitchen table and crying my eyes out and just being obliterated by that yeah. and taking that again. Once again, it's another just bearing it like Kyle's not good enough, like and just right. internally storing that. And um, and and there was situations like that throughout my whole childhood that most people would look at like a, a blip on the radar just like oh it, it is what it is but like i would take those situations and just carry them you know yeah um like a huge rock on my back and um you know i uh had a lot of friends growing up you yep. know I, my neighbor was one of my best friends i had another really close friend across the street and and um uh, my childhood like outside looking in, it's per- it's fantastic. Again, I had grew up in a house where I say there's probably not a chance to put more love in that house, right? And yeah. um, when I, well, I feel like especially in Greenville, and if you're local to Greenville, you know this, and I'm sure it's like this everywhere. But me and me and Ben were talking about this the other day. Um, there is a a serious party scene in in oh, East no doubt. North Carolina and Greenville no in Greenville, and it's that that's praised. By the it's, way, it's normal. Like yeah. it was, it's normal. So right. by the time I was seventh grade, right, um, I was I was smoking weed every weekend. Yeah. Right, like we were playing like Hey Mister and getting somebody to buy beer yeah. every weekend. For you know? sure, and um, that was like to like the a peer group. Like that was okay. Like right. you know, like I would be in front of fusion skate shop or, or the park downtown me and my buddies and being six seventh grade smoking cigarettes in front of this guy's store or park and right. we're like it, it's fine and the guy's like dude no it's not like you can't be you're in seventh grade you can't be out here smoking pot on my stairs i got customers coming in here you yeah, can't do it no but to us it's like Whatever, it's not that big a deal because all our friends say it's okay. The older crowd says it's okay. I was okay. gonna say the older crowd and the older crowd is they're probably yeah. they're probably pushing you in the direction, they're telling you it's okay. Me. Plus, you're watching them skate on the on the box at back door, and you're you're trying to be like them. And and and, of course. and back to what you said in the very beginning when you started. I know that this happened for me. Plus, I had an older brother, but when when the older crowd would approve of something it's on because of my insecurities because i had some of the same insecurities you had then it was on on. and one once they once they were like you know oh man you know do this do that and i thought they were cool or they thought i was cool or i thought they thought i was cool man it was over and i and and they had me in the palm of their hand or or that life really had me in the palm became very attractive no doubt became very attractive i remember um me and my mom were laughing about this the other day i remember um i had a neighbor i had a neighbor that was a little bit older than me he's probably i don't know five six years older than me i would say And like we're talking about, like, I always hung out with an older crowd. Like, I always was around an older crowd, usually, right? And me and my little group of friends. But this neighbor in particular, me and him spent a lot of time together. And I just follow him everywhere, you know, being a little kid. And um, I remember he had uh, some of his friends over. And they were probably 13 at the time. So I'm probably a solid seven or eight, right? And I'm just over there just kind of 
being a nuisance probably to them and just annoying them a bit. And, and they're um, they're smoking at the time. And I think Cigs? I, 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 you know, at the time, at the time I'd hit a cigarette. Because cigs was time. a big thing when we were coming up. It was epic, huh? Yeah. Somebody yeah, had the I matches. Like, somebody oh, had the, cigs were like, I mean, I, yeah. I knew a dude so crazy. He used to try to dry dip out and roll it up. Oh, <laughs> <my>. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, but, but when you're a kid, you know, that like you're, dude, we used to go to the bowling alley, bro. Yeah. And we used to take the, the 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 prison oh, shorts out of the ashtrays in the bowling alley like that's how screwed up in the I head know. we were dude and so like, wanting to be accepted that you're willing to take that you're willing to, well they had them in the vending machine so you were scared to go to the vending machine oh yeah i remember you know that. what i'm saying I you remember, remember that, that. and yeah, you're I like marvel red you know like 425 and you know so dad give you a 20 bowling 16 bucks you bowled one game and you had some change left over dad's like why you got money left well dad i bought, I bought a pack of cowboy yeah. killers you yeah. know what i mean but if you wanted to bowl two games and you didn't have enough for cowboy killers well you went and robbed the ashtray because they could smoke in the bowling alley which which brings another whole thing up of what was normal then so like a lot of these gateway things not necessarily just gateway drugs but gateway lifestyle of what we thought was normal yeah and like get into that like in other types of conversations but like people think the world screwed up now dude like the 1800s bud it was brutal. It was brutal. Like, it was brutal. But back, let's back up, get, not to get off track, but we used to rob the ashtray at the bowling alley, dude, and blaze up prison shorts from Nancy. So gross. <laughs> Bowling a 260 so with gross. a glove on. <laughs> you know what I mean? And she's just cuffing them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just cuffing and puffing, dude, and taught, like, just, they're, they're playing. And you're they're catching pl- them. They're playing 1988 cornhole into the oh ashtray my. with Marlboro it's Reds so in gross, the bowling it? alley, it's dude. so gross. So, look. <laughs> anyway. So, my neighbor, right? yeah. he's got all his buddies over, and, and they're all smoking. And I had hit a cigarette a few times because they think it's funny to like let the seven year old like, hey, hit this mm. and watch me cough a little bit, yeah. right? And uh, I remember those guys all being there, and everybody kind of gathered around, and 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 me wanting to be a part of them. Like, hey, let me hit that cigarette, yeah. Right? And and they're like, my neighbor looks at me, and goes, this one's a little bit different, so. When you hit this, I need you to inhale really hard, is what he told me. He's like, you just really breathe in really hard oh, to let shoot. it rip. And I'm like, yeah, whatever you want me to do. You know, let's do it. Yeah. Back and to I the acceptance. Back and to the yeah. acceptance. And I did this. The older crowd. I did this maybe once or twice and, and blew my lungs out, right? And and I got so high. Like, it was ridiculous. It was pot, you know. And I, and I, got, I got ripped. And um, I remember walking across my yard to go see my mom. And in my head, it was a cigarette, right? Like, I didn't yeah. know it was it was weed. I didn't know it was that. I thought it was a cigarette oh. still. And I am ripped, right? So super loaded. And I walk into my mom's house. And as soon as my mom sees me, she's like, oh, my, what is going on here? You and know? how old were you? Ah, man, I mean, maybe maybe seven, seven eighth grade, no, seven or eight, seven or eight years old, eight years old. Wow, I was a little kid. Wow. So my mom sees this, and it's like, whoa, because my eyes are probably bloodshot, and and she sees me just high as a kite. And I remember that experience, not being a good one. I was scared to death. Sure. And, and again, in my brain, I told myself, like, I thought it was a cigarette. And the only person that I knew that smoked cigarettes every day, all day, was my aunt. So I told my mom, like, laughing, I'm like, I can't believe Aunt Janet feels like this every day. This yeah. is awful. You know, and, and um, <laughs> you know, this is terrible. Like, how does she function like this? I'm you not know laughing I mean? to like, Janet. But, dude. <laughs> and, uh, but, yeah, and I, it, that was probably, like, my first experience, like, getting loaded yeah. at that young. Oh, wow. And it wasn't a good one. That's not good. It, it, wasn't, a, it wasn't a good one. And, and seven I, or eight years old. Yeah, so seven at seven or eight, or eight years old. old, getting that loaded, do you think that – not, not okay through the through the training through right. the experiences uh-huh. through the wellness programs through all of your um experience yeah well through your uh self-recollection or self you know um what would be the word i'm looking for here um i'm with you more aware of what you were doing now than you were then and being able to reflect uh-huh. self-reflection sure do you think that those thoughts that you were talking about at the beginning of the episode do you think those thoughts because you got loaded at seven, eight years old, do you think that some of those insecurities and thoughts, because you know when you're, when, when you're abusing substances, 
and please correct me if I'm wrong clinically, but my experience was when I was ab abusing substances of all kinds, I was always depressed. They're, dep they're, they're in many ways depressants because they screw with your head. Sure. You know, they, they, I mean, they get in your head and then you start feeling a certain type of way about yourself. And sidebar, I think this is very important to bring up because everybody watching this right now, whether they want to believe it or not, they, they all do it. That's how the human brain works. They go through guilt. They go through this. They go through that, right? Do you think that because that kid tricked you at seven, do you remember at that time having any thoughts go through your head about, okay, this guy took advantage of me. I'm not good enough now. Or, I'm, or, or I did this. Now my purity is gone. You see where I'm asking? Do you see where I'm going yeah, with this? Yeah, I do. I, I, or have yeah. you ever thought about that before? I never, I mean... I think, think maybe that's think why that, you had think, some of those I thoughts. I think that it, well, I think that at that specific situation, it was a practical joke that they were doing. Like I think it was funny, and I don't think, and I didn't put two and two together about that being what it was until years later, right? Right. Like, I didn't. It wasn't like when I was twelve. I was like, oh my gosh, that was weed. Yeah. You know? Like I, I, that was years later when I was like, that happened. Right. You know that happened, and I, and I guess I've never put like two and two together. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess I've never really thought about that. Oh, something to think about. Something then. to think about. Um, CT, OTW, I'll get, get, get you fired up over there. I'll make you think deep. I'm um, a deep well over here. You know what I mean? But, uh, you know, like, by the time I was seventh, eighth grade, that was the thing, right? And, and, and we talked about, again, like, kind of the environment that a lot of us grew up in. Even, like, we, I was talking with Ben. Ben said the same thing. Like, it's, it's – um, there's, like, an underbelly of – and, the, and I'm sure it's in most cities, but it just felt like this because this was home, right? That, For sure. That, uh, like, this was okay. Like, sneaking airplane bottles into an ECU football game in freshman year of high school, like, everyone's doing that. Yeah, but it's not okay. It's not okay. <laughs> yeah. It's not, like, you're in ninth grade. You know sure. what I mean? You're, you're a kid, you know? Sure. Um, but to us, that, that that was what it was. So, so we just kind of fall in line with that. Um so do you think that comes down to individual wiring? I don't know. Because I, I, I'll tell you why I asked that question. I asked that question because I, I grew up in, and I don't, I don't know if you did or didn't, but I grew up in a very, very, very Christian family. Very Christian family. But my individual wiring, my heart knows right and wrong. Oh, for sure. My heart feels the presence of the Lord. My heart feels the Holy Spirit when it comes over me and the Lord's talking to me. People call it conscience. I'm going to tell you right now, that's the Holy Spirit, okay? But my wiring, Tyler's own data of dashboards, of dashboards, was wired, I was going to rebel. Or better not going to rebel, the wiring in place, just like getting this podcast started, what we were supposed to do in six months and 45 days, all while breaking records in my company, that same drive, that same physical drive, that same mental drive, but it was going in the other direction. 1,000%. You know what I mean? It was going in the 95 percentile bracket downward versus the 5% of people that go up with the slight edge, right? Mm -hmm. So do you think individuals have, with your expertise and your experience, I mean, do you think that, I, I mean, whether no matter where you come from or what DNA is in your body, individuals have their own personal wiring and how they handle things. I mean, we're all different, right? Would you, would that be a, would well, that be I a think, fair I statement or is it still influential, influential of what's around you? So there, there's definitely an argument for, for a genetic pre, I, I have in my family, a long line of alcoholics, right. a long line of alcoholics. And, the circles that, that I spend a lot of time in, we talk about being like irritable, restless, and discontent, right? And then, and what like ease and that. irritable, restless, and discontent being my natural state. Got it. Right. And, and what drugs and alcohol inevitably did for me was it ease that irritable, restless, and discontent? Like we've talked about this oh, before. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. What, that's, it's yeah. like, I think that, um, I think that, um, alcoholism and addiction, I believe is genetic. In, okay. my, in my in my opinion, and, and and I think there's a lot of people that will agree with that. Um, I think I got it pretty honest, right? And I think that sure. if you look down your line, you'd probably find it too somewhere. Right? Sure, yeah. My granddad, Papa JT, broke. He broke the cycle from my granddaddy Lloyd. So my granddad used to pick my granddad up out of the front yard on his way to high school in the morning. 
and drag him inside and then go to school and do his thing. Mm -hmm. And he made his mind up that he wasn't going to live that way. So he broke the cycle for our family. Mm -hmm. And then in turn, my dad, my dad's been sober since he's 25 years old. He's 60. Well, how old am I? He's 67 years old. So he's been sober that long without even trying. He just made it. But but when I say he's been sober, he played basketball at East Carolina. So he wasn't really a drunk anyway. He just was an athlete. So, I mean, they had some beers just like the normal way to go. But when he married my mom, he told us. I'll never forget. He told me right after I graduated high school, I was like, Dad, why don't you drink? Because right. I'm 18. Right. And here I am getting shattered. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I'm sure. like, and we can't take it in the house, dude. I mean, my mom, dude, right on up to I was a grown man, she was like, you don't need to bring that in here. Mm -hmm. You don't need to bring that in our house. And we ended up like bending her mind a little bit. Like, oh, it's okay, Mom. It's just beer. Oh, it's good. Well, then the beer came. Then that liquor came. Well, then she wasn't comforting the situation. But because she loved us, she was like, oh, okay, they're handling it. I want it. them here. Well, they're handling it. We, we, they're okay. They're going to make it happen. They're handling it. And so I'm just going to allow it. But we were talking her into that, right? So, so back up a little bit. So, so dad said when he, when he got married, he was like, when I was 25 and I got married, I knew based on what my dad had taught me, mm -hmm. so my papa had taught him, was that I didn't want to go through life with that reputation no, so they broke the cycle and then no offense like I picked it back up but now now I've decided to break that cycle again sure right so sure. think about it what you were I mean I, I think I think that it's definitely uh, genetic I, I, I that's just my thoughts and and I think that um, of course I do believe that outside influence does play a part I mean you are your environment sure right it's it's um, I do truly believe that but I do think that somebody who is truly chemically dependent and suffers from addiction and alcoholism it is genetic i do believe that um and uh i think that's kind of uh part of the battle yeah. with, with a lot of people right I, I i really do um but uh yeah I, I, you know being at home and being here i mean like we like we talked about it was it was it was normal what we were doing. Like it, it was, it was completely accepted. It was fine. Parents might not have been cool with it, but the, the guys that were four five, six, seven, eight years older, they were fine with it. Oh, you know, know, it was all good. It was normal. We watched them do it. They let us do it around them. So it's like, it's gotta be okay. Um, so for a long time, you know, through high school and stuff like that. And I talk about this a lot because you have a lot of people that get sober and, and, and they'll say things like, um, uh, my worst day sober is better than my best day drunk. Yeah. I don't believe that at all because if we're being honest with ourselves, we had a lot of good times drinking and drugging. Sure. Like a million yeah. percent. Like sure. I'm not going to sit here and lie and say, and say stuff sure. like that. Right. But I get the concept. And I think so it's a for, mind, that's a mindset. To tr it's like a training mindset. Sure. Of course. Like a coping mechanism to stay sober. So you don't. Yeah. 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 Cause if you tell yourself being drunk's awesome <laughs> and you're trying to stay sober, sure, you're, you're sure. not going to stay sober, but it's like playing the whole tape forward. It's like, we'll get to it, but it, yeah. we'll talk about like, what's your truth. Let's, let's be real here. Where does it stop? Right. right? Because the years when I was in high school, it was just that, you yeah. know what I mean? We're ninth, 10th grade. There was we also little, had no responsibilities. No. And, and there was a keg party where everybody got together. It was 40, 50 of us and called it a day and went to school the rest of the week and did it again on the weekend. And that was it, right? right? That was that was okay, but um, see, I was just trying to make money off the cups. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you were that guy. You were that I was, guy. Was chasing people down. From day yeah. one, dude. Chasing people down. I need that five dollar cup from yeah. day one. Yeah, day one. Um, but yeah, I mean, went r jumped right into high school, and and um, I always excelled as an athlete. Okay. You know, I, I did pretty well no matter what the sport was and, and, and found kind of where I really excelled was baseball, but I worked really hard at it. Um, so by the time I was in like ninth grade, I, um, I had created kind of this, um, like this all this, these, there was two Kyles, right? There was, there was one Kyle that was on the baseball field that parents knew and, people that were kind of outside of that circle knew and then there was another Kyle that that liked to really party and and, and live like that and um and I and, and and I ran that a long time you know and 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 you know by the time I was in ninth grade I, I got introduced to um a crowd that was that was selling a lot of drugs you know that were that were and it was a crowd that I had no business being anywhere near you know it was on it was on uh, another other side of town and it was it was people that were at the time uh some of them have really straightened their life up but um 
at the time they were not doing the right thing and and i fell into this situation call it and and um got introduced to these people and and I started selling a lot of weed and having access to it. So then I started playing this like two Kyles, right? Like you have Kyle and Apollo khakis and Sperry's at DH Conley, right. right? And then you had Kyle after school that was that was doing this other stuff, right? right? That was hanging with these other people and doing these things. And um, that that grew right as time went on through high school that grew and, and and i carried myself that way where i'd present one way and then behind closed doors i was doing a lot which which ended up being a a, a common theme with me in my life right i'd present one way and then, and then i'd be doing something else behind closed doors which i think that a lot of drug addicts and alcoholics do that right yeah, they sure. present one way they oh, yeah. present face closed one door way, policy man for sure yep and um so high school goes on, I, you know, I'm in a serious relationship and, and the girl I'm dating and she, or girl I'm dating's uh, mom is a teacher in the school. And, and it's we've got the baseball going on. The baseball team's killing it. Um, it's all good, you know, and, and um, you know, I got a little sister. Uh, she's seven years young. I can't believe I didn't didn't talk about that before, but I got a beautiful little sister that's. Uh, seven years younger than me, super smart, sweetheart. family is hell, sweetheart, yeah, sweetheart, full of drive and just can do anything yeah. in the world brilliant. still. Brilliant young lady. Brilliant. Um, and, you know, everything at home's healthy, everybody's good, and, and trouble's starting to happen at home, you know, where, where mom and dad are starting to see things that I'm doing and being like, hey, what are you, what is going oh, on? Oh, because we know everything, and we know that they're not going to catch us. Oh, yeah. Because we know what we're doing. Yeah. We, we, we know that they don't, we know that this is so funny that you bring this up we know they've never done that and we know what that life is like but we think they don't right we don't realize like they ain't been that down they road. work the people yeah. that, or they whether they work the people they know the people what we didn't realize is they know what that life's like which is why they don't do it yeah 100%. <laughs> so we we think because as kids we thought this is what i thought is that because my dad didn't sell drugs he didn't know what it was about right 100%. <laughs> you know what i mean because my dad didn't do drugs or drink alcohol he had no idea what no. i was doing because he didn't do it Not a clue. Well, but the reason is because he knew exactly what it does to yeah, you, 100%. which is what we find out later. Yeah, carry on. Yeah, a thousand percent. Yeah, and, carry uh, on. That that's actually a good point. A lot of my, uh, later down the years, a lot of my drinking and the way things would escalate and stuff like that really remind my dad's told me this and my mom have really reminded me reminded them my parents of behaviors that they saw growing up. Right. So my gra both uh, both my grandparents were gnarly alcoholics. Right. So gnarly alcoholics. My dad got raised by his grandfather. So for the better part of his his life him remembering his dad was a nightmare when it came to wow. his dad you yeah, know he sat sure. in a pool hall gambling drinking all that so you're exactly right so I come in the door they'd start seeing behaviors and things that i'm doing and they go absolutely not yeah. like what is going on and they tried everything in the world uh, my parents have always tried everything um to support me and help me in any way um but uh which is an understatement which is an right? understatement a thousand yeah. percent for um, everyone for for everyone. for everyone in this anyone listening to this know that now for the most part yeah know that now that for the most part your parents don't want this for you a thousand for percent. the most part and if they love you they want you to act like you got some sense for sure you know they want better for you they yeah. want better for you all the time um so high school, I'm doing this, and it's starting to create problems in the house, and, and I'm partying on the weekends and doing that and kind of wide open, but still keeping that, like, um, other image up as well. And, and um, my 11th grade year, you know, I'm, I'm still selling selling weed and doing all these things, and, and, and my 11th grade year um, was when, like, the rude awakening started happening, right? So I, I was I was doing a lot. I was excelling in baseball. We're doing well. We're going for another state championship, that whole deal. And and next thing you know, um, I'm starting to run into trouble with, with police officers, right? Mm. I'm starting to – this is starting to happen. Like they're – I'm, I'm getting random run-ins with cops, and, and they seem to be on me a bit, you know. And, and Dick I got, Tracy was chasing that tail. Man, <laughs> and, and um, starting to feel heat on that. And then um, – I was I was still selling a lot of weed, and I got a phone call one day from a friend of mine's dad, who was a uh, was a police officer and, and 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 worked in drugs, and and he called me, and uh, as he knew me my whole life, and he goes, "Hey, 
whatever you're doing, you need to stop. And I'm like, this guy's a pretty, they know I'm in the police department. So he calls me and you need to stop. Like you're about to get in a lot of trouble. Like, I don't know what you've got going on, but you need to pull the plug like now because your, your name is on my desk and your, your picture is on the wall and you, whatever you've got going on, I've known you your you're whole life. Up. You're in trouble. Yeah, like you're, you're showing up. You need up. to stop. Yeah. So I go, whoa, pull the plug for a yeah. while. Right. Pull the plug for a while because that scared me. You know, I'm I'm still a kid. I'm I'm a kid. That terrified me when that man called me, and uh, so I listened to him. You know, and and I quit and I quit selling the drugs and I'm still doing my drinking and doing that. But uh, I listened to him for the and I fall back and and a couple months go by and uh, you know nothing has happened. So I, I'm thinking it's kind of blown over. So I got a phone call from from some people that 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 wanted to buy some weed. So I said I can make that happen. Let, let me you know let me put two and two together and and we'll make it happen. And that day I'm sitting in fourth period and uh, I'll never forget the resource officer for the school walks in and I'm in art class and he's like uh, it's Kyle in here and and I'm like well, yeah I'm right here and he goes uh, well you need to bring your stuff with you because you ain't coming back. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, that ain't good. I had a wad full of money in my pocket, and I handed it to my best friend next to me. He was sitting in the desk next to me, my neighbor. I hand him that, and I'm like, I don't know what's going on. I hand him that money in case they were going to search me because it was somebody else's money. And uh, I walk out in the hallway, and there's like four cops in plain clothes. They just grab me, put me against the locker, and put slap handcuffs on me. And they hit me at that time. They hit me with four felonies and six misdemeanors. In and eleventh grade. I, in eleventh grade. Wow. In eleventh grade, and I had sold to an undercover cop like fifteen times or Ooh. something like that, and they had me. Wow. You know, I had a, I had a brand new Tahoe in the parking lot that my parents bought. Yeah. They took that. Yeah, I mean, it was a show. The girl that I was dating's mom was at the school. She's freaking out. She's a teacher there. I'm dating her daughter, and it just, yeah. it was a show. Like, and um, it was a, it was a big deal. And and the whole school, and the whole school saw me get walked out. Yeah. So they, when they arrested me. I'll never forget this. When they arrested me, they arrested me right there at the end of school, like 20 minutes before school lets out. And we're right in the middle of a state playoff, too. Mm. We're getting ready. We're right there in that facility. Getting ready for playoffs. Yeah, we're getting ready. Yeah, the end of the season. It's a big deal. So into the the baseball season, so into school. Yeah, it's summertime. Into your eighth grade year, summer's about to be out. 11th grade, You're feeling yourself. Yeah. I mean, 11th grade, Somewhere around that ballpark time. You're feeling yourself. Yeah. Yeah, Memorial Day weekend area. Something like that. Gotcha. And, uh, and, uh. I, think I remember seasons matter sometimes too, you know. I remember sitting in that parking lot and school lets out while I'm sitting in the back of a cop car with the window rolled down right outside of the parking lot to where every like students literally have to walk by me to go to their cars. Whew. So the entire school just found out that Kyle got arrested. And he's in big trouble because it's a show out there. There's like they there's cop cars every. It was a they put on a show and they wanted to do it for a reason. They wanted to prove a point, um, which I later found out. Sure. Um, but Sounds I remember like that embarrassment. Uh, it, that was an unreal experience. And uh, I remember them loading my Tahoe up on and and, and dragging that out of there and. Um, oh, they towed it out of the parking lot. Oh yeah, they cut the tires. They, I mean, the, somebody had told them all types of stuff that I had. I mean, when rumors started flying around the school, I'd hear people call me and they said they heard that this, that, and the third happened. It just was not true. But I mean, they 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 made it. So an mom and dad example. couldn't even come get their car. Uh, no, that took a battle. Like that was no, but months I meant like, later because okay. of the because of the vehicles being used. Mom and dad couldn't come get the car. They considered that Kyle's vehicle. They 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 took that car because oh, wow. I sold drugs out of it. Wow. So they, that was technically then they had proof. proof. Uh huh. Wow. Uh huh. And um, so I remember I remember being um at PCDC Pitt County Detention Center over here, at, and I was eleventh grade. You know, I'm sitting in a parking lot, and I remember my parents showing up, and. I remember being like on the other side of a gate and and I remember my parents in the parking lot of this garage talking to these cops and the cops are telling them what's going on and what's happened and and all this. And I remember my mom's face and my dad's face like, what are you saying right now? Like, what is going on? And they they really had no idea, I don't think, that this was going on, that I was selling drugs, that I was doing all this. They were giving them all this information about the people I was associating with and that other side of Kyle at the time. Right. And they were devastated. Mm -hmm. They were just, they couldn't believe it, you know. They couldn't believe it. And um, 
So that they ended up getting me out, and and, and thank goodness you got a good lawyer, and, and we took care of that in the courtroom. It took a long time, but they wouldn't let me back in public schools for a long for for the rest of the year. So we were trying to figure out where's Kyle going to go to school. Like what, what's going on? Is he expelled? He's kicked out? Is he going to go? And and I wanted to go play ball my senior year. That yeah. was that was so. Um, uh, a previous coach at D.H. Conley went over to uh, Farmville Central and, and took care of the baseball program over there. And uh, he reached out to my parents and, and said, hey, if you guys can work it out, I'd love to have Kyle come play for me. I'd love to have him out here. I'll keep an eye on him. I'll take care of it. I can work it out on my end. You guys just do whatever you got to do in the courts and, and whatever that whole process was. And there was hearings and all that. It was wild. And, I'm um, sure in 11, in 11th grade, it was wild. It was wild yeah. at the I time. Mean, yeah, it like, felt like your world was ending. You yeah, know? it was sure. It was, I'm sure. Um, and uh, we, we ended up getting it worked out. And I went over to Farmville Central and I didn't know anyone other than a couple of guys I'd play ball with on travel ball or whatever. And, uh, and, and I remember my, f I, I, I'm, I get this big sigh of relief that I'm going back to school. Like, okay, that's taken care of. Like, wow, that was gnarly. We're still battling that with, with probation and all that. But, um, my first day at Farmville Central, I pull in the parking lot and as I pull in the parking lot and my assigned parking space, there was a resource officer, a police car there and the principal sitting right there outside of my parking slot. The first day of school. First day of school. And like first day of school in spring and in, in, in fall. When I returned my senior year. Yeah. In fall. Okay. Mm -hmm. My senior year. And uh, so. You've been enrolled through Pitt County Schools legitimately. You had a class schedule. All right. So first you day up. of farm was Okay. And. Uh, and uh, I pull in the parking lot and I knew that there had been a lot of there had been a lot of rumors about this kid that was transferring from Conley, this ball player that was transferring that got into all this trouble. And, and I already had a horrible reputation right off the jump, you know, and I pull in the parking lot and this cop and, and, and these people are sitting outside my parking space. And I'm like, what's going on? And I, as soon as I pull in the parking lot, get out. Resource officer grabs me, pulls me to the back of the car and they search my car right off the jump right in front of the whole parking lot the school everybody it's 7 30 we're walking into school same situation that i just walked out of at dh Conley. everybody's watching the, the new kid get his car pulled apart again you know and this is his first day mm -hmm. so that's the that's the that's the standard that i set first day of of my classmates and stuff seeing me as like this kid's in trouble on his first day and I hadn't done anything. I had nothing in the car. There was and at nothing. this point, you're not doing anything wrong. You're, have you rehabilitated yourself somewhat? Somewhat. I, I mean, mean, for the interim. For the interim. So I, I, I'm, I was still drinking a little bit when I could get out of the house. But, I mean, you were done selling. You were done hanging oh, yeah, with I that crowd. Done. You were done selling. I'm falling out of that. that. Falling out of as that As far scene. as the selling side. That's done. So so you, you, you took the summer to get your head straight. Fell back. Screwed on straight. Uh-huh. And you were done dealing. So when you... Okay, I just I like to I like to paint a picture like this because yeah. not only do I love our law enforcement, okay, but some things that they do are I, I question. Uh, sure, you know. So I'm wondering, did you give them a reason for that? And I'm not. This this doesn't make this point here. I just I don't know. For, you know, for, that's for a dialogue. Good, yeah, I like to know. That's, were you still behave? Were you behaving like you were supposed to, or was there? You know, I'm talking about were you behaving like you're supposed to? Like, was there a reason that they should have searched your truck? Or was this just because you were the new kid with a bad past and they didn't give you a fresh start? That's the example. That That's the experience that I had. Okay, that's was, all I wanted so, to ask. I, mean, I just wanted to ask. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the experience that I had was, and and, and I'm not going to say I was a saint between the time that, that the, the situation happened when I got arrested. And I don't think that, I'm not saying that at all. Right. Um, because I was still out doing, when I could sneak out and do what I was doing, I was still doing that. And, right. And, but as far as... The legal stuff, the illegal stuff that I was doing, that it took a big step back. But okay. I think to answer your question, I think it was my first day. I was the new kid. They wanted to set an example that this is not going to get tolerated here, and we're on you. You gotcha. know what I mean? So, but that first day was like a room shaker because I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to show up here on my best behavior and do what I'm supposed to do and come to school and, 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 and do all this. And, and my parents were furious about that. They were yeah. furious and they were upset about how I got handled at Conley too. when I got arrested. Sure. But, um, but, uh, so I go to senior year and, 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 and I jump in and, and I, uh, I've always been like a chameleon, right? Like I could, I had pockets of friends everywhere, right? right? Like everywhere from every, whatever you want to call them, social group in school, whether it's the guys that were playing sports I hung out with. It was uh, 
I had I was just a chameleon. I hung out with everyone. I had friends in in, in all of those circles, right? And um, I did the same thing at Farmville Central. I just found a crowd and we we started rocking and baseball started going and 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 long long story of the short for for that senior year I had a great year, like my best baseball year I've ever had. Um, best performance I've ever had. Uh, I did okay in school, um, all that. But um, at the end of the year, when it was all said and done and, and we had jumped into playoffs and, and we lost out, I had a decision to make that like we had talked about before. I had a decision to make. I had a few colleges that, that were willing to bring me in to play some play some uh, junior college ball, right? And, and um, at the time, uh, I felt that I was really burned out on baseball. I truly did because, I mean, how many games were we playing a year? You had school ball, you had travel ball, you had whatever other league that you're doing. I mean, you're playing three or four different teams a year. You know what I mean? So it's it's a whole year thing, and that's known for in Greenville. But I was really sure. burnt, and, and I made the decision to um, – I was starting to drift into a headspace, a, a really bad headspace, to where I was over baseball. I, I, I wanted to go live my life, whatever that was, um, which inevitably led me, led me to really know that what I wanted to do was go party like I wanted to go right. party. I wanted high school to be over, and I was already hanging out with the downtown and doing that kind of stuff, and I wanted that. that, well, you that probably, yeah, and you probably, and, and that always heals. You probably felt, felt, felt failureistic at some point. Like, okay, like, I screwed this up. Like, I, I, maybe you did, maybe you didn't, but, like, did, did that ever come up? Like, okay, man, I, I don't think I can climb out of this. So I just, I'm just going to go party. I'm just going to go focus on what yeah, I'm doing. I, does that make I, sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, that, I think. That was that kind of where you were at? I think, there was, I think there was a thought process of there's no point. Right. That's what I meant. Yeah. So it's, There's no point. Like I, and, and, and It's not I, substantial anymore to your goals. Yeah. And, and you didn't know probably at the time like we do now where we surround ourselves with books and yeah, and and, and, and mentors and things yeah. that yeah, none of that was there. I'm sure, a lot of it was not. Not um, to degrade your story, sure, or, sure, or, sure. Or, or degrade you, but I meant like as an adolescent. Oh yeah, you don't know what's teenage, going on. Yeah, yeah, none of that was there. Yeah, um, and uh, so baseball was done, and 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 we jumped into that. Right, we jumped into to the next. Yeah, head first in the deep end. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. on now. No, you, it's on the now. Pool. It's on now. Skip and, the kiddie pool. Yeah. Um, I uh. I jumped both feet in. I jumped both feet into that, you yeah. know, wide open and 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 like a lot of us, like I was downtown Greenville, eighteen years old, nineteen years old. Fake old, ID. Fake ID. Four or five of them. Who you was know, your fake ID? It was usually the older guys that I was with. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I had one. I had one from Virginia. It was Tyler William. <laughs> <laughs> I, I used to go. I used to go downtown with people, and and somebody would be twenty one out of the crowd, yeah. and they're standing in line with me as yeah. I'm trying to go, and I'll hand the ID to the guy at Fifth Street, and he's like, "You know the guy who owns this car is standing right behind you," <laughs> <laughs> and you're like. You gonna dude, let me in or what? Let me in or what, dude? I mean, I got twenty five dollars. You know, yeah, so let's do it. It's, it's penny draft, man. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you the whole thing. Let's do it. Look, and, uh, you're, so how old are you? I'm right out of high school. No, how old are you right now? I'm thirty one. Thirty one. So I'm thirty. I'm about to be thirty eight. So when I was coming up, driver's licenses were still laminated. <laughs> and they were plastic. Yeah. So you could go in and cut that. You could go in and catch oh me. You could, you could, DiCaprio, dude. You could catch me if you can. Passport <laughs> photo swap out, dude. And so I would, I would, I took my brothers and, and laminated over my picture on his thing. But then I, then I ended up using his when they went plastic. But do you ever remember that? You don't remember where they weren't, they were not, they weren't plastic up remember. until like 2000. So like, that nine nine ID, you had. I mean, it was like Gold. catch me if you can, dude. Gold. Oh yeah, you could. I mean, you could cut and paste and all that. So anyway, so you're you're oh, fake ID in it. Hilarious. You're diving into you're you're diving in. So did you graduate from Farmville Central? Uh -huh, I did. So you graduated from Farmville Central. Now you're you're diving. Now you're diving into college. It's life. on. It's on. College life without college or with college? Were you oh, no college in sight. Yeah. Okay. Not, so not even now you're thought. just diving into the to the to the weekend aspect of the college student, but not the the weekday, weekday weekend and everything right. in between. Yeah. But so, all week. Uh, yeah. Seven days. Eight, eight days. Yes. Okay. And um, I started I started going back and 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 and. Uh, doing my thing, selling some weed on the side, and and that would put me in different circles, and and then um, I I got into shortly thereafter I got into a relationship uh, with somebody that this was the first time in my life that like I've been able to just go full board 
that there's no breaks on this because she's rocking too you know what i mean and we could just oh, go bonnie and claude bonnie and kyle wide open. And, <laughs> and, and, you know and that was yeah. the first time that was the first time that i had had that experience because other relationships that i so you got had, a bonnie and kyle devil's lettuce situation kinda, yeah. going on dude. so so you the, were going in uh, the other relationships i've been in i yeah. had to keep that on the hush hush yeah. you know like it was the it was the cheerleader at school that didn't really know what i had going on and the girl at farmville i was just trying to be the sure. best guy i possibly could be and then this time i'd fell into a relationship where we were we were keg partying at three four times a week we were you know it was just wide open that that greenville downtown life is what we were in full effect and full swing and uh i um we just yeah for a while we just went full board in that you know drinking every single day like you're waking up and you got the shakes you know what i mean at, at like 20 years old age, i'm not even yeah, legally enough to dry uh, to drink and and like at 20 years old like i can remember after a long weekend on sunday waking up like with the jitters you know and um and and so was everybody else in the room most ignorant comment of an alcoholic you ready yeah a beer cures a hangover oh yeah most ignorant dude yeah, every time i've said that dude I want to. I want to slap myself. You ever heard of front hand backhand, <laughs> Key and Peele? Yeah. <laughs> front yeah, hand backhand. Yeah, yeah. I want to front hand and backhand myself for every time I've ever said that. What that really means is you need to stop. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, a thousand percent. A thousand percent. Carry on, dude. You're absolutely right. You know what I'm talking yeah, about? I do. Like, like we're front like hand, backhand. Right, drink it off. Hair of the dog. Yeah. Nah, dude. Oh my you need to quit, bro. If you feel like that, like you're, you got it. You've taken this too far. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean you are drowning in the barrel <laughs> yeah you know what i mean but go ahead and uh but like everyone had the jitters in that room when we woke up oh, on yeah. sunday you oh, know for sure. and it's because we've been drinking since oh, yeah. tuesday you yeah. know y'all are going and, to sake with satan's liquidity church at that oh point no doubt and i can remember in those time periods and i know you've had this experience where you would like dust it off and then go home to mom and dad's house for a shower and like some food and like try to recuperate or whatever and just feel like god absolute. gives me anxiety and a stomach ache and a oh, headache all at the same time goodness. thinking about it i ha i miss all of that life this much I know. Burnett came through and dropped it on me yesterday dude he brought me like five jars of honey yesterday um and my boy's working on some cbd he's working on some cbd infused honey that he's dropping soon is he i'm so stoked is he is the honey in your boot bag or is honey's it underneath that shelf is it oh, you don't put worry it in about me dude i'm way ahead of you <laughs> Why it's hey, like come you on dude <laughs> dude so we got some local honey here stick your finger in that bad boy look at that that is Farmville Central's, or Farmville's finest right there. That stuff right there makes that stuff on a shelf taste like crap. That is good. How are we going to get you, it in here? I don't, dude, you need a spoon and stir it. How you got to stir it? Dude, I'm not it. using dude. it in my glasses. Uh, no, you don't. Dude, <laughs> dude, you stop. <laughs> Why not? Come on, dude. You know I don't have a plastic spoon. <laughs> Why a spoon, cousin? <laughs> Why not an axe? Yeah. Because it's dull, you twit, and it'll hurt more. Dude, I'll just use my glasses, bro. Don't do that. That's disgusting. Dude, look. That's delicious stuff. Mm. That is good, bro. You try How good, Tyler? That's yours, by the way. Hey, that's yours, by the way. That is good. Look, eat on that. I put my in my coffee every morning. It's my pre-workout usually. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Eat that right there and then go go to the grocery store and Alright, we need to get hunt. something to put something into something. I think old buddy to go hunt something now. We'll get back over here. We'll fix it when he gets back. Just do a plug. Yeah, get back over here. We'll well, honey's from bees, so there's no there's no uh, copyright infringement on honey. Well, <laughs> Is they, there? Those people right there are not going to worry about Unless it. you call my wife by name, then you're getting the, the Ginzu. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Get it, honey? Anyway. Um, so, all right. Kick it back up, bro. Are we doing this now? Yeah. Where have we been doing it? Oh, we're talking right now? Yeah, we're going at it. Kick it back up. This is a day in the life. There it is. Uh, yeah, this I is got, a day in the life. I got two phones. All right, keep going though. Yeah. All right, so where are we at? So you fake ID. Wide open. Fake ID, wide open. You're an you're living like a college student without class. Yeah, that's exactly right. Pretty that's much. Exactly that's what right. I did too. So. so I there there was a period of time where my mom had the idea of. of I'll take it. 
uh, she had the idea of, Thanks, brother. of you need to go back to school, right? Is that a healthy dose? No, you need about double that. Okay. I feel like I'm mixing up uh, fiberglass resin. That stuff is so delicious. It's ridiculous. You got to drop some in your coffee, by the way. You have to do that. It's a pretty epic experience. So you want some more? That's brought to you by my uncle. That was his idea. You want some more? I want one more of those, just like you just did. Is it okay to put the coffee-dipped knife in the... Well, that's your jar, so you do whatever okay. you want. I'm you know what I mean? with it. You know, yeah. Is that a healthy dose? <laughs> Tyler's like, I'm going to mix it with my eyeglasses. Like, dude, I'm, I'm no, good. we're not doing that. Dude. You know, we're not... I'm good. I don't want your... your Eyeball you juice. I don't ear. want your eyeball you juice want my in my ear yeah. sweat. The back of my ear sweat on it. Yeah, I'm good. All right, here you go. There's honey, buddy. Mmm, that's delicious. That's brought to you by Farmel's finest. That is delicious. Um, okay, so okay, college going. student, college student, no classes, right? Right. Um, wide open, a thousand miles an hour, and and just living exactly how I want to live. I think at the time I I had like a. I guess you could call it a job with my dad. And, oh, yeah, and maybe even working for you sometimes, cleaning up job sites and stuff yeah, like that. talking Remember? like a thug on my job site. Yeah, <laughs> offering people beer on your job bill, site. I got my building contractors going, bro, <laughs> who is this kid you got <laughs> working for you, man? I was like, why? He was like, man, he won't shut up, and I think he's going to sell me some weed. <laughs> <laughs> so Tyler oh. called Tyler called me one day. It was probably oh, right around this time. He called you, me. you know what's you know what is so ironic about this? You were actually working oh my God, on my that? you were working on the duplex that later on down the road. See, I wasn't married yet. And you were working on the duplex you were not back in the yet. back of Brook Hollow that I ended up buying that same half that you were in that day. For my family, from 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 one of my best friends who built it. Yep, dude. I Tyler ride. calls Tyler calls me one day, and me and Tyler had a great. I've known Tyler for a long time. Like I've I've known Tyler when he was probably eighteen. This is on about the same time, right? Well, I met Tyler when he was about eighteen, so I'm about seven years younger than yeah. you. So I was a kid when I met him, and. Um, and anyway, years later, he, he has me do, you know, my dad will call him and be like, you got to give Kyle a job or something. Or I, I'll work for him. And he's like, okay, just have him call I'm me. From a fed up state of mind? Yeah, like, <laughs> you got to, do you have something he can clean kind of thing? Like, yeah. you know, he needs to make some money. I'm tired of giving him money. So Tyler calls me one day on the job site, and he goes, dude, are you walking around the job site <laughs> offering beer to people? <laughs> yeah, that's you what it your was. You had crew? a six-pack. Yeah, one of your buddies walked on the job site that I had met before. I thought he was, like, on that kind of level with me. And I'm like, hey, you want a beer? I got a cooler over here. Yeah, here Natural I am. I'm trying to run a business. And <laughs> Ben's over and here he, selling solo cups. And he, Tyler calls me. He's like, you've got to be kidding me right now. Dude. Are I was you like, walking well, I, I was like, what are you doing? doing? I know what it was. It was Taekwon. Because I had a, I had Taquan working there because he was trying to get some extra money, and he was like, he's like, yo, bro, this kid's wild. He was like, yo, bro, you gotta, you got a kid up here, yo, and I'm telling you what, Tyler, he he trying to he he, he trying to sell me bills, yeah. Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> I so called look, Kyle. I was yeah, like, what, what are, are you doing? doing, dude? So <laughs> that, around that time. Okay. Or wide open. Which, as, as understandable. You can, as you can tell, yeah, like I, I got to have it all the time. We're, 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 um, we're, we're going to Understandable yeah. at this point. And um, honey's anyway, good, by the way. It's delicious. It is. That is this. Marvel's finest. Yeah, that's awesome. It is. Um, so I'm a hundred, I'm a thousand miles an hour and, and, um, I'm in a relationship. We're both a thousand miles an hour. Everybody I'm around's a thousand miles an hour, and it's just what it was. And and um, I think a lot of us have had that experience. Yeah. Where there's about a year or two where that goes down out here, and um, so at that time, I was really doing a lot of drinking, and then I was I was cocaine started kind of getting in the picture a bit. And, and, and that was happening and starting to happen more frequently. And, and, but it still kind of wasn't a big deal. It was more of a party thing. And then stuff like ecstasy started to come in the picture. And it was a, it was a big time period for that. And, and it just was that. It was just partying wide open. And, and, and whatever happened that night happened that night. And, and what were you doing for money at this point? Working either for my dad or like weird jobs for you, pick cleaning stuff up when you had it, or, or um, I was back selling drugs a lot. Uh, I was okay. selling a lot of weed and doing all that and 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 living that. Um, but then 
things started to really kind of start to spiral with my behavior and, and then what started to really happen when I put drugs and alcohol in my body, right? Like it would, it went from it being fun and a party to like this, this show just doesn't have an end, right? Like it, yeah. it's, um, it's not like we're going downtown till two o'clock and then we, then we get some pizza at Michelangelo's and then we call it a night. It wasn't that, you know, it was, right. it was, we're partying, we take a break and then we keep going until next thing you know, the sun's coming up and yeah. this would happen all the time. And then uh, these other, these other substances started jumping in the mix to, to, um, to help that, you know, um, and then my behavior just started the upper uh, substances. Yeah. Okay. The things that would just keep me wide open would just, was starting to fuel that fire. Okay. And, um, so are we, are we 20 years old yet? This is pre 20, right at, 20. right at it. So you're fast forward through a few years of the same old, same old, right at 20, having a good time. Yeah. Wide open. Okay. Um, and in the and and I don't know the dates and times, but in the mix, I'm starting to get in trouble again. I'm getting you know DUIs and and possession charges and underage drinking. And um, I remember I got an underage drinking ticket twice in the same night by the same cop within an hour of each other. Mm. Like Man. he 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 gives me a citation. I think he took me down to You're county jail. Setter. He took me to jail for like a holding tank. My bondsman I had on speed dial came and picked me up. I went right back downtown with the yeah, same. Probably not a good on. sign when you're 19 with a bondsman on speed dial. On speed dial. Yeah, yeah I mean, right. he was and he was ready. And I came on the would come on the same street and walk past the same cop. He's like, "You've got to be kidding me," you know, living like that, just yeah, reckless, yeah. don't even care, yeah, just yeah. wide open. And and, and um, like I said, my behavior is starting to reflect that this is happening, right? Right, and right. I just don't care. And um. Because I felt bulletproof. We all do. At 20 years old, you know, got a good lawyer. Family will help me. You know, just reckless. You know, the girlfriend's wide open, too. You know, everybody I'm hanging out with does this. It's all good. Everybody right. I was hanging with was doing this. And um, But when these other substances started jumping in the picture, this is when, like, my behavior started to, to really fall. Like I'm saying, I'm getting arrested. These things are happening. I'm having altercations. We're fighting. We're doing all this. <clears throat> the, our relationships are just all over the board. I'm not able to like maintain a job really, unless it's with my dad. I mean, I'm selling beer on job sites for you. I can't even be on a job site for you. I can't, you know, I'm all over the place. And, uh, I, uh, I started, I started messing with like prescription medication. Okay. Right. Um, uh, really like Xanax. Like I started, okay. I started doing a lot of Xanax and, um, in, uh, at a young age, I had a lot of access to a lot of pharmaceutical drugs. Right. Okay. And, and, and just one of those things where, uh, kind of like how I think we all had that experience is we always, for some reason, knew somewhere to get something. Right. right. And, 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 and whatever quantity I really wanted. And, right. and so I kind of had, I started having like these pills and stuff kind of, uh, everywhere. And, um, now, was your main Xanax use due to the fact that you were you wanted to find a way to escape the trouble that you had created yourself at this time? I, looking back, I, I feel like it just. It, or was it, it just you just wanted to keep getting keep high? Keep going, keep just going. Yeah, keep getting it, high. It, it was. Yeah. It, it almost felt like for a long time it was seasons. It was whatever happened. It was like when I was younger, it was a whole lot of marijuana, and then when I get a little bit older, it's marijuana and alcohol, and then when I get a little bit more, the next phase is like alcohol and and cocaine, and yeah. then the next one it's alcohol, cocaine, and, and and ecstasy, and then it just keeps on going, and then when I get in, people that don't know when you mix like heavy xanax and or xanax in general and alcohol like you're, you're talking a blacked out disaster right you know and this was something that i started doing daily right like it was it was normal so then a lot of times when you mix things like xanax and and, and alcohol um there's no telling what's getting ready to happen here yeah. because you don't remember, right? And and uh, I would get in a lot of altercations, and, and there was one night in specific where, where I had an altercation with the girl that I was dating, and it was a disaster. Like, it was it – was um, I ended up getting arrested and, and, mm. and a lot of charges. and, and um, But what it did was it, it hit me that specific night, and I'm not going to really go into detail really about that, but it's it's that specific night based off of my behavior and what happened in that blackout and, and, and my inability to be able to function at all, right? Like just a, a, a angry, aggressive, violent mess to, to people that I really cared about, like my dad included. Like at right. the end of that night ended up me and dad on the ground, me in a blackout fist fighting with my dad. And... 
um, him having to hold me down with everything that he had until the police got there. Wow. And watching his son get arrested. And then, so it was a disaster, you know. <clears throat> and uh, I remember I went to jail that night, and then I got bailed out a day or two later. And my dad came and bailed me out. And I remember getting into his car, and uh, my dad had a black eye mm. from me, right? And uh, I remember being so devastated that, that, that this has happened. Like, what is really happening now? Like, and this is, like, and my dad is probably, you know, my dad and my mom are... are as far as a male figure, like there's nobody that's in my eyes that's better than somebody than my dad. You know, he's right. the greatest man that's ever walked the face of the earth. Sure. If he asked me, right, right, in my opinion, just yeah. um, and You're the right. fact that I was willing to to do that, you know, to somebody who cared about me to the extent that he did and supported me to the extent that he did, it was the first time that I had a real eye opener. Like this is not good. Like this is this is a bad thing. And yeah. I got a laundry list of, of of criminal charges, and and I escaped a lot more. You know what I mean? I, it could have right. been really bad that night. And uh, we made a decision that uh, we made a decision that I was going to go to treatment. Okay. Okay. We made a we made a decision, and um, I remember checking into this this treatment center first time with any experience like this and and i had no idea about about treatment none other than like what outside people would tell you about rehab right like rehab you know it's it's where uh it's like where you go for a place of embarrassment kind of you know this is what is what my mind would tell me like you failed you know like you're you're you're, sure um you're a screw up that kind of thing and uh we made the decision to go because something had to stop something had to change also was influenced with the amount of charges that I had looking at me. The court thought it would be a good idea. My lawyer thought it would be a good idea for, for this to happen. Right. And uh, it was kind of a collective. And uh, I remember walking in this treatment center and uh, being terrified of, I don't know what I'm doing here. Now I'm just in Greensboro in this like hospital-like place due to my behavior because I'm a screw-up, you know, and, and just uh, not even 21 yet. I'm not even legally allowed to drink yet, and I'm in treatment, right? And uh, I I got in there, and and man, there were some super impressive counselors and therapists that would that would try to nudge me along. But I think inevitably, like I knew in my head that I wasn't done, right? I knew I wasn't done, and that this was kind of a blip. And I had like I had like in my mind that I would come here, get recalibrated, and then I'll come out a brand new human, and this will never be an issue again. Right. right. They were going to grab me and dust me off. That was a thing of the past. You're going to come out of this treatment center in 28 days, a brand new man, and the world will be all well again. Right. Right. And uh, that's what I thought. And uh, so I go into this treatment center and I would start to hear things that, that, that I understood, like people's relationship with alcohol, like what it made them do when they drink. That was abnormal. First time you've ever heard anything like kind this, of, right? Yeah, the first time I'd ever heard somebody that's sober for me sitting down like a counselor that's been sober like 30 years would explain to me what happened when he used to drink when he was my age. And it mirrored me a lot. Right. And this guy, you know, people like that. And I would hear that and it would start to really pique my interest a little bit. Um, and man, I ran into some incredible counselors at, at that treatment program that really tried to help me. And, uh, but one thing, one thing that I would hear, um, I feel like when people step into like a room of recovery and, and they, they want to get into this space, it's v- my, my natural instinct is to, um, is to not identify because if I identify with you, then that means I got a problem, right? Like if I identify with the way that you drink and use that means i got a problem like you and i don't want that right i just i'm just here to get dusted off and pushed back into society i don't i'm not an alcoholic or i'm not a a drug addict i'm i'm just somebody who's had a bad couple years and needed to get dusted off so but when i would sit in these in these these groups and in these these meetings and stuff i'd hear people share about them doing things like heroin or or drinking like a fifth a day or a half gallon a day or every day. And, and like, I would go, well, I'm not like you. 
I don't do that. You know, I don't. Yeah. I just, I just like to drink a bit and do some cocaine and just kind of party. Like what you're doing, sitting in a hotel room by yourself, drinking a half gallon of whiskey. I don't do that. So I'm not an alcoholic, right? Right. Or I've, I've never done methamphetamine, so I can't be a drug addict, right? Or I've never, I've never put in, put a needle in my arm, so I, I can't. I'm, I'm not like you. So, so, so. Like, whoo, thank, thank goodness for that. But I, I'll keep on going and I'll learn from this experience and we'll keep on pushing. So that's how I walked out of that treatment center. <clears throat> Basically with no real change, just a, just, nah, just, just a, some experience. Just some experience. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, it was recommended that after the treatment center that, um, I didn't go home. It was recommended that I, uh, went to a halfway house with them. And um, then go to an Oxford house, which is like sober living, like a democratically ran sober living. Um, so I'm like, OK, I'm game. My lawyer's like, this is what you need to do. Twenty eight days is not enough on paper for this to go away. So you need to do more. I'm like, all right, well, I'll stay. So then they moved me to this halfway house, which is like very little freedom. Right? In, like, Green in Greensboro? In Greensboro. Okay. So I... Uh, I went from like an inpatient setting where you're literally on like a hospital wing all day. Right. Okay. It's a really nice facility and I don't want to make it seem all doom and gloom because sure, it's not, but sure. uh, that's, it is what it is. Like that's the reality out there right at that time. So I go to halfway house and, and I'm, I, I'm in there with a bunch of knuckleheads, just like me all around my same age that didn't really care. Any freedoms? Nah, not really. No phone? Had a phone. Cigarettes? Had a phone. And then so cigarettes? Yeah. Oh yeah. We're wide up. Oh man, you're in treatment. You're smoking cigarettes like okay. chimney smoking. So so phones, cigarettes. This is the halfway house. No nothing. So no, when you no, move to the halfway else. house, when you move to the halfway house, so you went from an inpatient, pretty much locked down all day, supervised all day, like you lived there, to the halfway house where um, you're living in like a home okay. now, right? Like you're it's 24 seven staff, but there's like a house manager there and you just kind of, you do all your grouping and programming in the afternoon so you can cook your own meals. You can do that kind of thing. Right. And then after a time period, you can get your car for certain periods of time. If you wanted to drive to the gym or the grocery store, you could have that at some point. So that's where I was. But I'm in the house with a bunch of knuckleheads that really didn't care anything about getting sober. Not one bit. Gotcha. Right? Um, there was an older gentleman in there that really took it serious, and, and he would kind of stay off to the side away from us. And I think that he also probably didn't want to hang out with a bunch of 20-year-olds either. Yeah. Um, but he was serious. You know, he had had his life. He, he had his butt handed to him, and he was ready. So I think he's still sober to this day, actually. Praise uh, God, baby. Yeah. That was a long time ago. That was 13 years ago. Nice. Um and anyway, so wow, all of so us, that was thir this this story is thirteen years ago, something like that. So you got a seven, you got a six year run in this thirteen years, oh, yeah. a big one. Okay, because yeah. you're seven years sober, the twenty third of this year, twenty twenty two, right? January January twenty third, twenty twenty two. So we've got just to, just so the audience understands, we've got six years roughly, give or take, mm -hmm. from Greensboro's first visit until full sobriety. Yes, is that correct? Yeah. Okay, that's all right. Very, I just wanted to close. I just wanted to paint yeah, that picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's close. Give or take. That's close. Okay, give so or then, take. So um, then, so we're 13 years ago from, give or take, from today, at this story. I'm 19, 20 years old. I'm not legal to drink. And we're seven years sober, sitting here today. So in a month or two, in a month, in a few days. Yeah. So Janu January. Okay. Yeah. So um, just to paint a picture for sure. And, so that um, your first treatment, you still. Less safe to say that you're still headed. I'm, in a, I'm headed in a worse place. Okay. Big I just time. wanted to paint that picture yeah. respectfully. Definitely. Okay. Um, Carry on. But uh, so I'm in this halfway house and, and we start um, hanging out a lot and people are getting ideas and, and, and what can we do? And then we started smoking a lot of like synthetic weed, like K2 and stuff, because you could pass a drug test and everything. And we just started to just go way downhill. Right. It just and. uh Eventually, I moved out to what they call an Oxford house. Never found out that we were out there smoking, you know, synthetic weed or anything. We got passed out, and 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 we we go to his Oxford house, and man, I, I was there, and, and I had a I had a guy there um, who was dating a girl that's from here that I've known forever. So me and him had a pretty tight bond, and he would come hang out with me while I was in treatment and try to help me a lot, and put you know try to steer me in the right direction. You know, this guy, he'd been sober a while, and. Uh, so I move into Oxford House that he's the manager of, and uh, I kind of hung to his side, him and, and, and the girl that was local to here. She got sober. She was out there, too. So we were able to hang out, and okay. that was kind of special. That was cool. And um, and I hung out there. I, I did the Oxford House for, like, 
mm, maybe like a month, right? And um, the girl that I was seeing here, cause she came and, and saw me down there one time. She was all proud of me that I, you know, I got sober and done this thing. And she came and visited me one time. And I remember after she had left, I was ready to go. I was I was ready to go, and I made the decision. And in the in the in the first floor of that Oxford house, which is a sober living house again, um, that uh, I'm going home, right? I'm going Greenville. Home. I'm going to Greenville, okay. and um, mom and dad's home, wherever. Okay. So wh- you're just leaving. There. I'm leaving here. Okay. It's, I'm tired of the sobriety thing, and I'm leaving. Okay. You know? And uh, I don't know if I thought that initially, but I remember being on the drive home from Greenville, North Carolina, I'm from Greensboro, North Carolina, to Greenville, North Carolina. The first part of the drive, I'm like, I'm gonna go home, get my stuff together, get a job, whatever, go to college. I remember thinking positive things. And by the time I was halfway through that drive, I was on the phone calling people, figuring out who's got weed, who's got Xanax, who's got this. So in a matter of a three hour drive, I had changed my mind from doing the right thing to we're going wide open. And within and within no time, I was full blister again so i had done this treatment stay tried to dust myself off okay stepped out did nothing right i just went right back at it which is important for me to talk about because a lot of people have this experience right they 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 not many people get sober on their first go right i mean rare like i i've i've met you know i've met people working in treatment that have been to rehab 30 40 times and this wow. is real. And this is, wow. there's a lot of people that will know that. Um, so I say that because I got experience. I got the experience that I need. And, 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 and I, I hadn't had my butt whooped enough where I'd made that decision to really kind of turn. And I was right back off to the races. And here we went, right? I was back home, um, wide open. I don't remember where I was really living. Probably at mom and dad's or a girlfriend's or wherever. I was just partying. And um, we pick up right where right where I left off, and some right, and and um, you hear that story a lot with with alcoholics and drug addicts. Like you put it down, and then you relapse, and then when you relapse, like you pick up right where you left off. Like it, it it's like you didn't even miss a day, right? And that was my experience, and and I was right back to the races, and I was right back living that kind of toxic life, and. Um, yeah, I, I things after after that first treatment stay and, and my return back to drinking and using, I mean, it was like all the brakes have gone now taken off. Like every I have no restraints. Like this is now now I'm living even more reckless now. Like now there's more pills. Now there's more cocaine. Now there's more drinking. Now there's I'm getting older. Now I'm 21. Now you can't tell me nothing because. I can walk into anywhere and buy alcohol right right? now. All restraints have been lifted now. And, um, and that's, and that's just how it went. Like I, I just, I, I just, I lived like that for another couple years. And, 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 um, I ended up, I ended up on the same stairs of that same treatment center, like two or three years later, and the story that I told you about, about me sitting in that treatment center saying that I can't relate to you guys because I don't drink like you, right? Or that I don't use like you, so I can't be a drug addict or alcoholic. I now am there, right? So now I remember sitting on the front step of this treatment center, my dad dropping me off. And I remember sitting on the front of that treatment center looking out at the parking lot at my dad's running Silverado that he's sitting in. He drops me, he, he, he gives me a hug, he loves me. And, and, and I'm here for you. And they're all supportive and, and everything. And, and I remember sitting down, smoking, chain smoking Newports, watching my dad walk across the parking lot and sit in his truck. And I remember just chain smoking and looking at his truck. And I felt like he sat there for hours. Mm-hmm. And I knew in my head watching my dad, I probably was out there 45 minutes to an hour until the counselor came in and was like, hey, are you ready to come ready on, to do man, this. let's go. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, my dad sat in that truck and was crying his eyes out, mm. you know, cause he had watched, he's watching his baby boy again, walk into this treatment center and just a mess, you know, which is not what they raised me to be. 
And uh, I knew that that's probably what he was doing. And at this point, you're definitely worse off than you were the way first worse. time you went. Way worse. Yeah. I'm, I'm, physically, I'm physically dependent on drugs and alcohol okay. at this point. I, I have to have it. Like, I have to have it. I have to have the pills. I have to have the drink. I have to have the cocaine. I've got to have it all. Like, yeah. and, and, um, or I'm, I'm detoxing. I'm sick. I'm, 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 I'm this. Um, and uh, I remember sitting... I remember sitting in, um, in this office doing this intake and I had left something in the truck with my dad. I think it was like a, my carton of cigarettes or something. And, uh, I'm like, Oh my God, I got to call him. I got to bring it back. He, he's right down the road. He just left. So I call him and I will never forget the sound of my dad's voice on the call. I mean, he was crying his eyes out still. Right. And this is this is an hour and a half after he had dropped me off. I mean, I mean, this this was this was I mean, he sat in the parking lot for a while. So it had been some time since I'd seen him. And he's still that upset where I can physically hear him over the phone just destroyed. Mm -hmm. And I'll always remember that. You know what I mean? And and sure. This is what I've done. This is this is the truth about what you've done. Like you. Right. You are starting to really hurt the people that care about you. You know what I mean? And and that's spreading wide from aunts and uncles and cousins and mom, dad, my sister. At this point, she has zero relationship with her brother because I'm just I'm so out in left field that we just can't even communicate. Right. Right. Um, I remember that. And I remember that that feeling and, 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 and that I had done it again. You know, and, and here we are. So I walked into that treatment center with a lot of with with a very different perspective um, that I'm here for a reason now. Like this is an issue and this is something we need to take very seriously. And. Um, so I go in that detox the first time that I ever went through a full detox. And um, so for five to seven days, I was probably as physically as sick as I had ever been to that date. Um, no sleep, sweats, throwing up, the whole thing. And, 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 and that was uh, sharing a room with somebody else while they're going through the same thing. You know, it's, it's a pretty intimate experience when you're going through that with somebody. Like you're watching sure. both of sure. each other just run through it, go through it. And, right. Um, one thing that I that, – that, I always carry with myself and, and kind of how I convey and work with other clients too. And, and I think it's important is, is I started to get some real experience in this treatment center and watching how people care for other people. Okay. Um, in this, so, tre- we're, so we're making our way. We're, we're, we're in treatment. You th- would you say this is a part of your story? You're getting ready to make your way on the way up. Maybe there's a way up and then there's a big way down. So, okay. So, but this is, this is the time. But it's this important is the time. You're yes. Learning. I'm starting, starting to, I'm learn starting to soak up. I'm starting to soak up what it means to be sober okay. and what it's going to take okay for me uh, for for me i'm starting to retain information and hear things that i never heard before okay i'm starting to relate okay right um got it that's i important. remember i remember there was this there's this counselor his name was willie he's like uh he'd been like 35 years sober gnarly crackhead and just 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 hilarious guy but he's been a counselor forever in a day right like the coolest guy you've ever met just walk with this like you know lean to him he's just the coolest guy ever and i remember being going through my detox and i'm sitting in this room shaking and everything and he remembered me from the first time that i came when i was a knucklehead and he would try to warn me and tell me things but i wouldn't listen sure and um i remember being in that bed super sick and willie came in and pulled a chair next to the bed pitch is dark in there you know lights are off and he goes man he goes you don't ever have to feel like this again Wow. He's like, I promise you, if you listen to me, you don't ever have to go through this again. And I heard him. Wow. I heard him. And that cut deep to me because I was, I was really, really, really sick, you know? And, um, he's just like, Kyle, you don't ever have to do this again, man, but it's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take a lot of work and it's not going to be easy. And, uh, guys like Willie that would, would, uh, hang on to me and, and from a distance, keep their eye on me. And, um, uh, you know, people learning, learning and watching how people care for people when they're when they're in, in their weakest moments is, is something that I really try to, to carry in my mission today with what I do. Right. And, and people like Willie were a big portion of that and, and teaching me how to how to treat another human being. Right. Yeah, and, sure. um, I took that to heart. So I go through this treatment center and um, I think I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. Right. And I'm listening to my counselor and 
about 15 days in, um, this girl comes in there, right? And and me and her both pique each other's interest. So it's a co-ed. Uh, this is a co-ed There's a men's situation. wing and there's a, w- there's a female okay. wing. But is there a time for yeah. grappling? Grouping. Gotcha. Not grappling, but yeah. it's There's, grouping, there's, time, there's times where we're yeah, out on grouping this, would be a better word. We're on the yeah. smoke break and whatever. Right? Yeah. Groups together. Got it. And uh, one of the main things that you'll hear when you talk about people going through treatment is not to get in a relationship within the first year. Especially don't get in a relationship while you're in rehab. Right. You know what I mean? Because both of you guys are in rehab. Sure, you know, sure. this is not time for romance here. Yeah. And you both of you guys have zero to give each other. You right. guys are both wrecks. You don't know yourself yet. Right. Not even close. And uh, so we both pique each other's interest. And the next thing you know, we're like talking and plans that she wants to stay in Greensboro. And I'm going to stay in Greensboro. And we're just going to get sober and ride off into the sunset together. And it's just that's the way it happened. And our counselors were both like waving us down. Like, yeah. This is not, not good, good, Kyle. Yeah. This is a disaster right here, and we. But we're you don't you don't know better than I know. You know what I mean? Yeah, you can't right. tell me. Yeah. You know what I mean? This yeah. is gonna work out really well. Like yeah, I, I, fa- I found her. I know what I needed. I know what I need to know now, and I'm done treatment. I'm done with treatment. Yeah. The scary thing about this, and this is extremely common. I mean, this happens every day in treatment centers. Okay. Every day. Because you're so vulnerable that uh-huh. you're just looking for something to grab, to gravitate towards, to make you feel better, right? It is so common that this scenario happens. And that's why there, if you look into policies and procedures in a treatment center, it's in there. Yeah, One right. of the rules that you sign up is no relationships in here, like no mingling. Yeah. For a reason. And uh, so anyway, counselors are trying to wave us down like this is bad. This is a terrible idea. This is not going to end up good. One of you guys is going to die. And that's what he would tell me. Like they were serious. Wow. They were like, look. Look at both of your track records right here. Yeah. If this goes bad right here, this is awful right here. Because yeah. now you've got a super bad scenario with a super bad scenario, and y'all tag team, and then y'all go that way, and both of you got it's not good. Yeah, hurricane disaster. Disaster. Yeah. So, but you can't tell me nothing. Right. So me and her both complete the program, and uh, we move into another Oxford house. And I don't know if I mentioned it before. An Oxford house is a sober living environment that's democratically ran. So you've got like a treasurer. You've got You've got different roles in the house. There's no, like, management. It's it's five guys, six guys in a house that live together and hold each other accountable. We drug test each other, and when they those houses get ran well, it's a really good environment for somebody to grow up in sobriety because it teaches you responsibility, accountability, all that. So me and her both move into an Oxford house. So a co-ed Oxford house? Negative. Okay. So they, they didn't have any of those in that area. So she was in a female. I was in a male. But we're hanging out every day. Like we're dating at this point. We're going to meetings together. We're 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 doing this recovery thing, and we're we're doing. We both are, both of us got sponsors, and and we're doing exactly what we need to be doing, supposedly. And uh, so we 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 grow this relationship in sobriety. And the reason why I think that it's very you have to be very careful getting into a relationship within your first year or brand new in sobriety is because when you when you're 30 days sober soaking wet or 60 days sober 90 days sober and you meet this person the person that you meet is this person that's trying to get sober this is the person that you know like you don't know this person before then other than the stories that they tell you don't really know them other than meeting them in a very vulnerable time in their life and then you cultivate a toxic relationship based off of both of you not having anything to give right and then this is the person that you meet this is the person that you get introduced to and you fall for i guess but when that goes south and one of you guys relapses and then you get introduced to that other person, um, that's a really bad situation uh-huh. because you're, you know. So me and her are in this relationship, and then one day she comes to me and goes, I want to get high. And I'm like, you know, I don't, I don't know about that. I don't. Nah, let's not do that. Let's that's a bad idea. Like yeah, you're, then you're you having to, you hold to, yourself you need to call, and her down. You yeah. need you need to you need to go to a meeting or you need Good to do sponsor. whatever. You, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Let's not do that. That's a bad decision. A couple of weeks later, she comes again and goes, "I, I'm, I think I'm gonna get high." Mm-hmm. And I'm like, it started creeping in my head a bit, and I go, "Yeah, I still don't. Nah, but we're not, I'm not. I'm not trying to do all that. You know, let's let's calm down." calm down and we talk about it and we i think that we kind of talk through it um and then i remember she went home on a pass she went home to visit her family and then when she came home she told me she's like you know um 
I, I I've been getting high since I've been home and and I got pills and and let's go and man that decision maker just went off in my head and goes yeah let's go do that so we both relapse in this Oxford house and and, and I remember they, they pulled a drug test on me and I don't think they suspected anything at the time but I think that they they it was just routine and, and a guy said hey I need you to test for the house and I go man you can save that cup because I'm dirty and, and matter of fact um, I'm out of here you know I'm, I'm gone so I went and uh, picked her up and now I'm on my way like you know now I made the decision like living the Bonnie and Kyle this life it. yeah so she and again she's met Kyle the person that got sober she's never met Kyle getting loaded really other than the, the times that we had used a little bit together and uh, so my, my foot's on the gas pedal so I said oh, we gotta go to Greenville harder than ever before maybe so I said, uh, I said, we have got to go to Greenville. If we want to do this right, we need to go home real quick. You know, and I, let me go get some party favors, and, and we'll make it happen. So we took a trip home and planned it to come see my parents, right? That's what we we're going to do. And, and I went and picked up everything that I could get my hands on, which was a lot because I'd been saving money. I, had my, I mean, it was on. Sure. And then me and her went that, and then we, we went back to Greensboro, and then we got a hotel room, and we partied. And the person that she saw Kyle turn into was not somebody that she had ever met for. And it scared the death out of her. Right. Cause I was nonstop 24 seven wide open. And to answer your question, yes, as, as worse than I had ever been. Yeah. I got my hands on a, on a lot of pills and a lot of alcohol and we locked ourselves in a hotel room for 48 hours, 72 hours. And we didn't leave, you know? And, um, I remember waking up and, uh, knock at the door and, I'm like what is going on like I wipe wipe the mess out of my eyes and just kind of crawl to the door what's going on and she's awake and in the bathroom and I go what's going on and I look out the door and it's her friends from the sober living or the Oxford house and I'm like open the door I'm like oh god and I open the door and they're like where's she at and I go she's in here getting ready whatever and then she walks out and she's all dressed and oh, ready to go and I look on the floor had, and the bag's packed she had yeah. She had called him because she had she had got scared to death of what She'd she just experienced. Yeah. yeah, she's I got to get out of here. The old call, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I felt like so betrayed. You know, like how could you do this? This was a decision that you wanted to make. This is what you wanted. Like we're about to go get this condo down the road. We're supposed to be meeting this. You know, we just had plans, right? Right. Like, where are you doing? And uh, she was making a decision for herself. You know, and. um problem was was I was off to the races now when and we've talked about this a bit so the thing that I, that I identify with with alcoholic and being a drug addict is is when I put that thing in my body I do not control when this thing stops I, I lose the ability of when this party stops yeah we had that conversation when we when I asked you to come on on my back porch so and and that's the repeat difference that again so just just so I it's have, clear for for people where they understand, I want them to understand exactly. Yeah. Because you've taught me a lot. Like I said, man, I don't, I don't have any personal training. I don't have any personal experience with treatment facilities. Mm -hmm. I don't have any experience with halfway houses. Mm -hmm. So explain that one more time, what, what that is, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and repeat that statement again, and then I'll say I'll be quiet. So... Up on the mic. One of the th one of the things that I, I, I identify when you, when you talk about in like recovery rooms and you hear people talk about their experience with drugs and alcohol, um, is is what is it that what is it that makes you an alcoholic or what is it that makes you a drug addict? Because um, there's a lot of people that have different relationships with drugs and alcohol, right? Um, in my experience, what helps me identify is the fact that. When I put something that is mind or mood altering in my body that changes my perception to reality, which is what I'm chasing at the end of the day, um, I lose the control of being able to tell you when this party stops, which I lose the ability to say, that's enough. I'm done. Um, which that's coffee, by the way. That's coffee, by the way. It's espresso. <laughs> it's espresso. <laughs> um, I lose the ability to be able to, to call that. Right. And 
I I understand that 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 I am when I I am powerless over drugs and alcohol. Okay. When they go in my Likewise. body. Likewise. Likewise. When they go in my body. Right. I am powerless. I I there's you can say all they want. I I lose the ability to be able to tell you when this party stops. Until something tragic happens usually. Um so, so here, she leaves. She leaves. You're powerless. I'm back you at lo- it. You've lost ability. Lost it. And you are back probably finding a new old Kyle. Would that make sense? A different old I Kyle? Am, yeah, I am. I, I am in a weird space of everybody in that town that I knew was sober, right? Was sober. And I knew no one that was getting loaded other than random drug dealers that I had somehow met. Okay. And I had some really good friends that were sober out there that really tried to help me a lot. Guys that were that were like um, directors and stuff at the Oxford House that would oversee a lot of the stuff. I'd, I'd become really good close with those guys in a really tight sober community and um, recovery members that really cared about me deeply and, and really tried to help me a lot. Um, and I was in this space of I've got to get loaded but I don't want to get loaded, right? Like, I don't want this anymore. Like, I don't, I don't want it anymore, but I got to have it, right? Right. I remember, like, I remember making, like, arrangements to get all drugs and my ability to, to get alcohol. I would eliminate all that possibility. Somebody would take my car. I would flush all these drugs. I'd give my money to somebody else. I'd do all these things, and I'd wake up in the morning and swear that I'm not going to put anything in my body and mean it to my core, right? Like, and right. really mean it. And um, an hour or two, I'm blowing that person up or I'm figuring it out. You know, I've got to get high, you know? And um, I was in this space of, of, of getting high, and I don't want to get high anymore. You know, right. I don't want this anymore. I, I want to be sober, but I can't get sober kind of thing. I'm in that, that, that place of really gnarly usage and uh and really wanting deeply to get sober um meanwhile i think my parents at the time i mean i was hiding everything i was doing from them they thought i was still in an oxford house and doing all this other stuff and they thought i was in this great relationship that we wanted to get a place together and just craziness and uh, so i get a friend of mine comes to me and goes i'll i'll get you back into sober living right but you've got to go to detox. I go, okay, let's go to detox. Well, I can't get into detox anywhere. So he's like, you got to go to the hospital and go to the detox and clear detox and give me a clean drug test. And I'll give you one more shot to come back in here. Right. It's like, okay, let's do that. So I go to this detox and I get off the drugs again. I think it was like four or five, I think three, four days, something like that. I get out, and my buddy says, okay, let's get you in. So I get into this Oxford house for a little while. Um, I had I had grown a really close relationship with a gentleman in Greensboro. He now lives in Charlotte. He's still sober. Uh, just had a beautiful kid. Um, I grew a relationship with this guy who really looked out for me a lot. He's a really good buddy of mine. And we had over the years we had uh, the first time i'd tried to get sober i'd met him and he really tried to help me but he knew i wasn't hearing it so he kind of distanced himself from me but we kept in close we kept in contact he'd message me every now and then like hey how you doing bro and i'm like yeah you know just check sure. on checking on you and i'm like oh i'm good you know he's like no you're not you know yeah. you're struggling quit lying. i know you are bro you yeah, got my number you know? in your voice yeah and uh so we we we, we grow a tight amazing how that works and incredible you can talk to somebody and the student this him, dude yeah. inevitably the dude inevitably ends up saving my life okay so um we grow a relationship and he's like hey we're, we're super tight and hanging all the time and he goes hey man i'm um i got this house coming up for rent and and i need a roommate what do you think and I go, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. I get out of this Oxford house. I've been here for a month or two, and I'm ready to kind of spread my wings. And he's like, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it, man. And uh, I got I got with him, and we moved in, and it's all good. You know, it's this little house over here in this nice little neighborhood, quiet, and just going to meetings and, and all that. And uh, living that life and doing well and, and doing okay and, and – um, I started to you see people when they when 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 people are trying to get sober they they start putting a lot of things in front of their recovery which inevitably leads to their downfall 
Okay. Right? Like whether it's work or whether it's the gym or whether it's relationships or whatever it is. You have I I I lose I lost focus on the fact that that this is my primary purpose is to stay sober because without this I have nothing. Right? So I start losing track of that slowly. Started going less and less meetings, starting to be less present in, in sobriety events and things that I would typically do. And um, slowly start putting things in front of that again. And, and you're not even, I wasn't even conscious of it. You know, this is just my day to day and I'd rather go to, I'd rather go to the gym today than, than go to a meeting. Or I'd rather go out to dinner with this girl over here instead of go to that meeting. Um, I know this event's going on, but I got something else I'd rather do, right? And, and started to kind of live like that instead of making my primary purpose of waking up every day saying this is the center focus of what I've got to do today. Everything else is going to fall second. My first order of business is, is recovery and how I'm going to stay sober today and the things that I need to do. And if I do that, then everything else will fall in line. I lose track of that. And um, so slowly I started making it less important for me to be sober all the time, you know, making that my focus. And uh, I will never forget that I um, I called my sponsor and I was supposed to meet him that day. And I, I go to this little Chinese spot that's right down the street from my house. I'm going to get these egg rolls that were the best egg rolls in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, get off the phone with the sponsor. And I'm like, hey, I'll see you in a little while. And he's like, all right, cool. So I walk in this little Chinese spot. And this guy's sitting behind the counter, and this guy is really high. And I mean really high, noticeably high. Like, he's nodding off behind the counter. And I remember in my head going, man, I'm going to tell this guy something, because you shouldn't be looking like this in front of this guy's business like that. This guy's employing you. You look like crap behind his business. This was the train of thought that I had. Like, okay. I'm getting ready to drop some knowledge on this guy right here to straighten him up. Right? Okay. You know? Right. And uh, so... I go into that conversation with that mindset. And um, at this point, I had dabbled prior to g getting sober uh, with, with like heroin and, 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 and IV drug use. I dabbled. Okay. Um, and I go to tell this guy this. And then the next thing that you know, there was a Walgreens next door. And the next thing you know, I was pulling out of the Walgreens drive through with a pack of needles and a lap full of heroin after talking to him after my intentions were to go in there and tell him that hey you can get sober and i can show you how because you look like crap yeah know? that was my intention going into that conversation and we talk about powerlessness right and wow. we also talk about thing events leading up to this where i'm not my primary focus is not staying sober. I'm starting to yeah. drift out into left field and not being conscious that, that this takes work here. You know, right. this is not. So I go into the conversation initially to give this guy some advice, if you will. And then next thing you know, I had a lap full of heroin. Wow. Living in a house with a guy that had helped me day in, day out, get sober. He's like seven years sober, six years sober at the time. I had maybe less than six months, six months, seven months, something like that. And, uh, here we go, right? I had, and I pull out of this drive through and I remember pulling through the drive through and then there's a parking spot straight ahead. I don't got to turn. I just kept on driving, park, threw it and drive. I mean, threw it and park. And, uh, and I remember I'd never been somebody that was real big in prayer, right? I just never had at that point. I grew up and I didn't grow up in the church. I didn't. I, I grew up in a house that was definitely believers, but they felt that you didn't have to go to church every Sunday to be a believer. Okay. It's the environment I grew up in. But I was not, um, I was not absent. I, I was never, I was never, I knew the concept of God and I understood the concept of it, right? And uh, I pull in this parking spot, I put it in drive, and all I remember was starting to pray. I started to pray that, I started to pray that God lets me live through this. I didn't pray that, that God don't let me do this. You know what I mean? It wasn't that. Sure. That decision had already been made. Right. That decision was there, and it goes back to, to my inability to be able to, to control when this thing stops. 
So my prayer was that God let me get through this. Let me live through this, you know. And I remember wrapping a belt, and, and away we went. And here we go. And now, like I told you, I had dabbled with IV drug use. Now we were full throttle because I just dabbled. Now my first relapse coming off a of six-month sobriety was with a needle. Mm. Right? So things have started to increase. And like I would mentioned before, like you pick up right where you left off. And maybe and some. Right? So this is what I start doing. Shh. At the time, it was I went from six months sober to daily IV drug use that day, right? And um, it was the summertime in Greensboro, and I was hanging out with people that were sober. I was going to meetings. I had commitments at meetings. I had um, I had all these things that were put in place in my life to keep me straight. And I didn't want to lose those things because those people were still very important to me. So I started to hide this. I try to hide this or think I was hiding this. So in the middle of summer in Greensboro, it's hot. It's humid in eastern North Carolina. And I would be putting makeup on my arms to cover marks. And just it was a disaster. And then I started drinking. Uh, I started drinking stuff like gin in the shower and and, and I uh, brushing her teeth to cover it up. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. All yeah. That. And it just this thing started this 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 person started to emerge right this this um, this heavy drug use started to really emerge where um, I'm drinking every day and driving you know and I remember like for work I uh, I get this job at this like pizza spot downtown Greensboro and uh, it's a delivery job and i was making no money at all like now that i think about it, it was absolute robbery what they were doing to me i couldn't believe it under yeah, the table sure and i am drinking and drugging all day long delivering pizzas that's what i'm doing like i would hit i remember hitting the brakes on my car one time and like watching airplane bottles roll out from under my seat mm. that meanwhile i got a friend of mine at home who's six years sober in a relationship doing exactly what he's supposed to do all the time and i'm thinking in my head that no one knows that this is going on. I'm hiding this really well. Like, nobody knows. Meanwhile, everyone knows. This is not news to anyone that Kyle's getting high, you know? So, my, my usage started to continue and things started to happen like overdoses. Like, I would... Um, I was overdosing quite frequently, right? And by overdosing, falling out, and then and then somebody waking me up, right? Like be, I'd be somewhere getting high with some people, and then I'd fall out, and next thing you know, I'd wake up, and there's people all around me, people freaking out, and, and that started to happen a lot. And fast-forwarding um, a little bit, a couple of months into this, this continues to go on, I, uh, I, I get this job, that's in like Burlington where they're building trusses for houses in a factory. Right. I got this like motivation that like, okay, you got to, you got to get tightened up, dude, what is going on? And, um, I get this job and I'm proud of myself. Right. I got some, I, I'm, I'm getting, I'm proud of myself. Right? Like I, I got a real job with real benefits, a real shot here. Right. Like this, this could be good for me. Right. This could get me straightened back online. So I'm going to this job. It's like 12, 13 hour shifts, you know, overnight and uh, graveyard shift. And um, I couldn't figure the workout. I couldn't. So the guys were trying to explain to me how to do this. And I was such in a daze and fogged and drugged out that like I wanted to be there and I wanted to learn. But I was so intoxicated that, like, there's no way for me to learn this. Like, you're not, like, I'm learning so slow. I can't keep up with it. I'm messing the whole line up. They're having to pull me to the side and try to, and these guys, and again, like a, like a common theme in my life, but people are trying to help me, you know. Like, there's an older guy in there. He was like, would pull me to the side and, like, go way off the line. And we'd get a, a truss out there, and he would show me how to do it and just break it down simple. And I could not compute what was going on. And I remember just trying to hold on and getting high and I'm trying to hold on to this job and I'm trying to hang around these sober people and I'm, it is just absolute torture, you know? It's just this 
internal battle that's just going off at, that I just I can't control. Like I can't. I want to go one way, but I'm getting just pulled in the other direction, and and I can't seem to get any headway. And um, the day came where the supervisors had the job called me in their office. And they go, and I remember the conversation just like it was yesterday. He's like, look, everybody here likes you. He's like, everyone here likes you. Like, we like you. The employees like you. But, man, you are just not performing. Like, I can't. Like, I, we've tried to train you, and and we've gone out of our way to, to do this for you. And, and this isn't a, a shot on your character, but I can't keep you here anymore. I have to let you go. And it went to the feeling of being a kid and, and just not being good enough, even though there's outside circumstances that are limiting my ability to be able to function in the manner that they need me to perform at. You know, like right. there's circumstances happening now that are that are keeping me from I'm sure now I could go back and learn how to build that trust pretty no quickly. Doubt. Yeah. No and doubt. um I remember walking out in this parking lot. Now you could probably teach yourself. Probably. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah I know. Thank what you God. Mean. Thank God for YouTube, you know, like we figured no, out. No, but I know what you mean. Yeah. I mean, now you can, yeah. You can and read an instruction manual on your own and build a trust. For sure. Whereas you weren't in the right headspace before. Definitely. Yeah. For sure. And uh, I remember walking out of this parking lot destroyed, man, like crying. And I mean, and I call my dad and I'm so upset that he doesn't know I'm getting high. Like he just think I live in Greensboro. He thinks yeah. his son's doing great. I'd call him when I wake up. So I sound decent, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, I call him and I, I remember I, 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 he probably couldn't even understand a word I was saying. I was so upset. Right. And he's like, he's just trying to calm me down. Like, Kyle, it's just a job. It's all good. Like we'll figure this thing out, but it's just a job. We'll go get another one. It's okay. Like it's, it didn't work out. But he had no idea that, like, you know, my mom's trying to call me. He had no idea what was really going on internally. And um, I, shortly thereafter, I, uh, and this is going to put me in California here shortly. Um, shortly thereafter, I was coming, I was coming home, and I walked in the house. And, and at the time, the gentleman that I was living with, really extremely hard worker, he was, Electrician, he was working crazy hours, 13, 14 hours a day, and, and doing what he was supposed to do. And he's usually at work at this time, right? Because I walk in the door and it's probably nine o'clock in the morning, maybe, because I worked a night shift. And um, I walk in and he's sitting in there, his sponsor's sitting in there, and my sponsor's sitting in there in the house, waiting for me to get home. So I'm like, well, this ain't good. You know, this is not good. And he's like, man, sit down. You know, and I sit down and, and there had been a lot of things that had gone on where he had he had known that I he knew that I was getting high and he had tried to help me and talk me and hang out with me and stuff and still letting me live there and just trying to hold on to his boy. You know what I mean? And, and just we were like best friends at the time and, and just trying to hold on and keep me close. And um, I walked in and he's like, sit down and. His sponsor was the man who owned the house that we were renting the house from. And uh, he's like, man, it's got some things I need to tell you, man. And I go, what's up? And he goes, like, everyone knows that you're getting high, man. Like, everyone knows, brother. Like, it, this is, like, I don't know what you think. He's like, I know there's makeup on your arm right now, you know? Like, I know that you're hiding these things. He's like, Kyle, I found... I found needles under the sink the other day. Like he started telling me things that like I have in such a fog and oblivious to yeah. just reality. I didn't even know that he knew this. This I was just in another world, you know, just consumed with drugs and alcohol. And uh, he's like, man, he was like, you know, like every night I go in your bedroom to make sure you're breathing. Wow. He's like, I go in your room to check to make sure that you're still breathing. Right. And, He's like, I, I, I know you're getting, you know, and he started just telling me all these things that he knew and that he was seeing and that things he was doing I didn't know and that he was doing behind the scenes to make sure I was okay. And, and he was like, you know, I, I've tried everything that I could try to, he was like, but you're going to die in my house if you, if we don't do, you're going to yeah. die in my house, man. And he was like, I love you too much for that. Like you're, you're, I can't let that happen. I can't. He was like, you've got to get out of here. You can't be here anymore. You've got to go. I'm like, okay. So, okay. So, 
like, well, where do I go? Right. So where does a drug addict and alcoholic go when, when all else fails? Goes to mom and dad's house. Right. Because they're usually they're always the person that will still take you. Right. They'll still. So I had uh, I had been talking. There's a friend of mine that had got sober in California maybe a year or two prior to all this. And he knew that I was a mess, right? And he would call me about once a week and check on me um, and put in my mind that, hey, man, like, I work in treatment now. Like, I have access to treatment for you. Like, if if you want to get help, you know, he didn't really harp on it a lot. He would just throw that out there. Hey, man, just keep this food for thought. Like, if you ever you want to do something and get right, I can take care of you. We can get you where you need to go. And uh, that was in my mind. So I'm getting kicked out of this house. I go to my parents' house. My parents at the time had no idea really that I was getting high again. So I walk into my parents' house and, and I watch my mom's heart just break again. Just because as soon as she sees me, she's like, oh, my God. Like, yeah, you're a nightmare, you know. And um, so I had made the decision that um, I had made a decision that I was going to get sober again. And this decision was made over about a week of, of me being home and still getting high. And but So I call my buddy in California, and I go, let's do it, right? And at the time, I was, I was again, wide open, and, and uh, overdoses are, are very close. This was right around Christmas, right around Christmas uh, of uh, 2014. And... Uh, so I'm overdosing a lot and I'm, and I'm getting high and I'm, I have a call him and I'm like, Hey, let's do this. Like, let's, let's, let's go to treatment, man. What, what does it take? And he's like, okay, well let's do it. So we start the process of this and I get a call from the treatment center and they go, Hey, I've got a, I've got a bed available for you in three weeks. Where I can in get California, you, in California, okay. we can get you in in three weeks. And at the time I was so scared of myself that I didn't think I was going to live three weeks. I mean, I was, I was, I was getting high like, like a death wish, you know, and this is just what it was at the time. When I got kicked out of that house, there was a couple weeks there where it was just on and it was scary. It was really, really scary. Um, and uh, I told the lady at the treatment center, I don't think I'm going to live three weeks. Like, you need to speed this process up because I don't think I'm going to make it. She said, three weeks is what I got for you. And I go, okay. So I remember praying a very specific prayer that two things are going to happen. Like I'm making a deal with God at this point. I'm going to die over drugs and alcohol or I'm going to go to California and get sober. I've got three weeks, right? I've got three weeks between here and now. Let's see which one you want me to do, right? So I'm going to get as high as humanly possible between now and then. Right. And, and I think I even remember telling him, I'm like, you got to get out of my way because this is going to happen one way or another. And I'm going to go to treatment and I don't need to hear anything between now and then I'm talking to my mom like this, you know, mm. somebody who loves me more than anything in this world no this doubt. Is where I'm at. No doubt. So this is, this is the deal that I've made. Right. Okay. So I try everything I can do to kill myself on drugs and alcohol in this three weeks. I was literally getting, this kind of goes back to my inability to be able to, to, to turn this thing off, right? Like this is, this is how I'm living now. I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting high IV drug use all day long. I'm hanging out with people that I should not have anything to do with. I shouldn't be anywhere near this. I shouldn't be anywhere and just, I just need to be around people that are getting high like me, right? And uh, so here we go. And in the middle of this time, I remember, I remember, I remember overdosing multiple times uh, in this period right here in Greenville. And, and um, I, I can't believe that I got pulled out of some of them. Some of my parents don't even know about, you know? And, um, the day came where it's time to go to treatment right here we are 
I had made the three weeks, and then my buddy had been in communication with my mom. My mom's known him his whole life, and she's, he's going to help her son get sober again and come to California. This is all stuff that I had done on my own and make, making plan, making plans and stuff to go out to California. My parents had nothing to do with this. I walked in the house and told them I'm right. moving to California. Right. I'm going to treatment in California. They're like, what are you talking Why California? What are you doing? I'm like, I'm going to California. I'm getting out of here. So the day came, and my buddy and my mom have been in communication, and my mom goes, <laughs> why i don't call january 22nd my sobriety date so she goes well what should i do should i go with him do i fly with him to california do i all that because i guess he's like absolutely not he goes you don't want to see anything that he's getting ready to do between here between north carolina and california because i'm gonna give it all i got right here at the end you know so gotcha I'm yeah gonna give it I'm, everything. I'm gonna give it everything sure we're gonna have one last ro- rodeo right sure i do not remember getting in the car i don't remember getting on the plane i don't remember riding on a plane i remember coming i do remember coming out of a blackout like in the dallas air like the texas airport and then going right back in a blackout but um i don't remember walking into the treatment center i walked in this residential home i guess and i walked in and i apparently i introduced myself to the whole house don't remember anything don't remember any of that i had i had drank from raleigh durham airport to LAX apparently as hard as humanly possible and and I had copious amounts of pills and just everything that I could give it right I can't believe I didn't overdose on the way out but um so I walk in this treatment center I apparently I introduce myself to the whole house the next morning I wake up and I introduce myself to the whole house again they're like dude we know who you are I'm like where am I at and they're like you're in California I'm like huh you <laughs> know I'm where and uh Started treatment in California. Okay. Started treatment in California. All right. Good. Yeah. Now, this is what we're going to do. Because I feel like this is really powerful. I feel like this has just been phenomenal. There's a few things that I want to say real quick. Sure. Number one, thank you for coming on and being very vulnerable, sure. courageous, um, exponentially providing information to help others, but also showing others that being honest with yourself is the key to success in this in this entire thing. Um, your your storytelling throughout has as I've been sitting over here listening to you. I, I'm over here shaping two episodes already in my head, and this is what I want to do. For one, I want to thank you for coming on. Two, I want to tell you that I love you. Love you too. You are like a brother to me. I ask you to refrain at my house. I asked you to refrain in my house because I wanted this very moment to happen right here. I never heard that story before. It's very powerful because I know what comes next. Yeah. And the next episode is what I know the most about Kyle. So to hear all of that and then to know what's coming in the next episode, I'm going to go ahead and call it. We're going to name this one Kyle Perry Part 1, North Carolina. And the next episode, we're going to name Kyle Perry Part 2, California. Yeah. And I want you to come back on next Friday, and we're going to film the California episode. And all of that same passion and dignity that you just displayed of recollection in the bad part, I cannot wait I cannot wait to hear you explain what you've just done over the past seven years. And I just want to tell you that, again, that I love you and that I'm proud of you and that I am so looking forward to the next episode and that I hope that everyone out here is looking forward to the next episode as well. Um, This is exactly why I made this show, why Ben and I made this show, is so that people could slow down take the time to understand exactly what it's like and what you're going through so that when you're at his first treatment setup, his second treatment setup, his third treatment setup, his fourth treatment setup, or however many times it takes, you've got a man right here that can explain to you exactly what you need to do so that you don't make the same mistakes that he did or that I did, because I can tell you right now, I didn't dabble in, 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 in heroin or downers, 
but I could have quit a hundred thousand times. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. And knowing what I know today, I would have, I would have quit, you know, ahead of time. I, I, I am going to close in prayer. Sure. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for just building this beautiful place in my heart and my mind to make this physical space possible, Lord. I want to thank you for my brother Kyle, Jason Carter, Ben, getting this whole thing up so we can reach through to the world. And that one person watching this will hopefully have change in their life and change in their me mental space and spiritual space and physical space that brings them closer to you and closer to the truth in their own life. As always, every time I pray to you, Lord, I thank you for your grace and your mercy over my life. I thank you for the blood that was shed through the veins of Jesus Christ to forgive me for my sins and my fellow friends and family. Father God, I just lift all of the prayer requests over the past few days that I've had in my quiet times with you and over my friends and my close loved ones. I just want you to, I just want to lift them up to you, Lord. I know you're going to take them and, and just bless them and take care of those requests, Father. Thank you for the many blessings that you shed upon my life, Lord, and thank you for the blessings that you shed around the ones around me and the, the ones that I don't even know. In your son's sweet name, amen. Dude, that was legendary. Sick, huh? You killed it. You